Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Bob Jenkins, and welcome to our first Winston Cup telecast of 1989. 20 of 29 races on our schedule for this year. It's the second race of the season. The first, of course, won at Daytona by Darrell Waltrip. He accomplished something he's been trying to do for 17 years. He has a great deal of momentum going into this race here. More momentum, in fact, than he has had in the championship seasons that he has had in Winston Cup racing. Well, Ned Jarrett and Benny Parsons will be joining me in the booth today. And here is their report from Victory Lane. Ned? Bob, normally the Winston Cup drivers wouldn't be that concerned about points this early in the year. As we introduce Benny Parsons, who will be joining us in all of our ESPN broadcast of NASCAR races this year. Benny, there is more talk going on now than ever before about points, and it's just the second race of the year. When I won my last championship, I think it paid about $8,000. Well, I won in 1973. It was worth $70,000. But this year, 1989, the championship is worth well over $1 million. And that number, $1 million, seems to have affected those fellows in the garage area because, Ned, you and I both know. Folks, that's all they talk about is points. It's the second race of the season, and they keep talking about points, points, points. Richard Petty has won seven Winston Cup championships. All of his money combined over the years won't equal what the champion will get this year. Better watch out for Richard Petty today. He's starting in 39th place, but he'll be coming up through the field. Now, a fellow who knows about points and how much money it pays is Bill Elliott, and Dr. Jerry Punch is with him. Well, thank you, Ned. This guy not hurting for cash at all. In fact, he's earned over $4 million the past three years, but he is hurting. We're talking about that broken left wrist. And, Bill, you went back to Indianapolis to Dr. Randolph on Wednesday, and he took the solid brace off. What did he put on? Well, he put this uh, movable brace on. It gives me, allows me to move my wrist about 20 degrees, and that just gives you a situation to where, you know, if I wore a cast for the full six weeks, then my wrist would be real stiff. And in this case, it'll, it'll at least give me enough, enough flexibility that I can move my wrist and work it where I'll be that much farther along in the game when I do get this off in another three weeks. We'll let you hurry on out to get in the race car. Thanks for stopping by with us, and good luck to you. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. He'll be climbing out of the car at the first caution flag. Jody Ridley will be going in. It is three weeks since he broke the wrist. That cast will come off on March 24th, just Friday before the postponed Richmond event. Let's go out to Pit Road and Jackaroo. Jerry, one team that had a disastrous Daytona was that of Rusty Wallace and the Kodiak crew, but they've come back with a vengeance here at Rockingham and have planked the car on the pole with a new track record. Now, Wallace and the team have a lot of reason to rejoice because beneath this tarpaulin, which will be coming off in just a couple of seconds, is a car that piloted Rusty Wallace to four of his six victories last year. It already knows its way to victory lane here in Rockingham. They captured the fall event with this car. The nickname of the car is Whitney, and they hope Whitney will be back in victory lane today. Let's go back to Bob. Thank you very much, Jack. So Rusty Wallace, Bill Elliott, Darrell Waltrip, Richard Petty, and 38 others are set to challenge the 1.017-mile North Carolina Motor Speedway for the Goodwrench 500. And we are live for an afternoon of racing here in the Sand Hills. Our Speed World coverage is being brought to you this afternoon by the Heartbeat of America, today's Chevrolet. By Quaker State Motor Oil, the big Q stands for quality, always has, always will. By Murata Fax Machines, built for the most important business in the world, yours. And by Budweiser, Beachwood Age, for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. 500 miles of exciting Winston Cup action coming up in just a moment. We'll be back after these messages. We're back at Rockingham, just moments away from the command to start engines. And 30, rather 42 cars will fire up and the drivers will get set to go 500 miles. There you can see Darrell Waltrip is being strapped in his race car. And there is the grid lined up on pit road as we are set to go here in just a moment. Start your engines. The pole sitter, Rusty Wallace who has set a new track record in qualifying. Darrell Walter will start right alongside him in row number one. Walter, the winner of the Daytona 500. Ken Schrader started from pole position in that Daytona 500. Today, he starts in third position right behind the pole sitter, Rusty Wallace. A tremendous field of cars and drivers are on hand here to challenge this racetrack. Built back in 1965, changed in 1969 to make the banks a little steeper and the speeds a little faster. And it has indeed been a very competitive racetrack through the years. So 42 cars are getting set to go now. And here is the starting lineup for this afternoon's Goodwrench 500. 
Rusty Wallace from St. Louis, Missouri, will start on the pole with a new track record of 148.7 in the number 27 Kodiak Pontiac. And Daryl Waltrip in the Tide Chevrolet car, 17 outside. Second row, Ken Schrader in the Folgers Coffee Chevrolet car, number 25. And Mark Martin in the number six, Stroh Light Ford. Going to row number three, it'll be Rick Wilson from Bartow, Florida in the number four, Kodak Gold Film Oldsmobile, and Jeff Bodine in the number five, Levi Garrett Chevrolet. In row number four, it's the Coors Ford car number nine, driven by Bill Elliott from Dawsonville, Georgia, and the Skull Bandit Oldsmobile number 33, piloted by Harry Gant. In the fifth row, it's the Motorcraft Ford car number 15, with Brett Bodine behind the wheel, and Rick Mast in the number 66, Edward Racing Chevrolet. Row number six, the Quaker State Buick car 26, driven by Ricky Rudd, and the Xerox Antifreeze Ford car number seven, with Alan Kowicki from Greenfield, Wisconsin, behind the wheel. Morgan Shepard starts in uh, position 13 in the Valvoline Pontiac, and then Terry Labonte in the number 11, Budweiser Ford. The eighth row, Crisco Pontiac number 88, driven by Greg Sachs, and the Sunoco Ultra Oldsmobile car number 95, driven by Sterling Marlin. Going to row number nine now, it's Davey Allison in the number 28 Texaco Haviland Ford and Ernie Irvin in the number two Kroger Pontiac. The 10th row has Dale Earnhardt driving car number three, the GM Goodrench Chevrolet, and the number 55 Crown Skull Oldsmobile driven by Bill Parsons from Denver, North Carolina. And as uh, you look at the remainder of the starting lineup, you will notice that some very big names, Dale Jarrett and Neil Budden and Lake Speed, are in the second half of the field. And the cars now begin to move away from pit road. And there was certainly a time this morning that we thought we would probably never see this scene. It just didn't look like we were going to get any racing in at all because we have had showers in the area. And the atmosphere is very heavy, thus not allowing the track to dry very quickly. They've had trucks out on the track since about 9 o'clock this morning, circling the track, trying to get it dry. And although it is not completely dry, there are gray areas showing. And so we're going to probably run a few laps under caution before they turn them loose under race conditions. But what about this North Carolina Motor Speedway? It is 1.017 miles in length. The pole lap time was 24.606 seconds, and the speed of Rusty Wallace was 148.7. 492 laps this afternoon, and they'll be able to go between 120 and 125 laps before a fuel change. So there is the uh, situation, and we have had already a change in the starting grid. Uh, Davey Allison will be starting from the rear of the pack, and let's go down to the pit area for an explanation of that. Well, Bob, it's a penalty that's been assessed by NASCAR. You know, they have a driver's meeting, as every major motorsports group does, before the start of the race to go over procedures. And what has happened is Davey missed that driver's meeting. So the penalty that's been put on Davey Allison and his crew is to go to the back of the pack. Now, one point to remember, though, is he will still be listed officially as having started in his qualified position. It's a penalty as if it had, the race had already started. So that's why Davey's in the back. For some more information on some things that are going to take place a little later in the race, let's go to Jerry Punch. Jerry? Well, Jack, it won't be very long, and they'll be coming back down pit road in a few minutes here when the green does come out to allow Bill Elliott to get out of the car. This man to go in at Jody Ridley, 46 years of age, a veteran driver from Chatsworth, Georgia. And, Jody, it's been six years since you've been in a car for four and a half hours. you got your work cut out for you. Can you take it today? It's a long race. Well, it's been cool as hell, and all it's going to help some. And uh, I think I'm doing okay, you know, just place myself. And uh, use, we always made it before, so I don't see why we can't now. I talked to Bill Elliott a minute ago. He said, I'll show you how much confidence I have in Jody. When I climb out of the car, I'm getting in my truck, and I'm headed home to Dawsonville, Georgia. So he better be able to make it four and a half hours, because I'm not going to get back in it. Good luck to you. Okay, thank you. Jody Ridley. One of the relief drivers standing by, and there's going to be maybe another one also. Mike Alexander has indicated he will be climbing out of his car pretty early. And Midwest driver Dick Trickle might get in that car number 84 that Mike Alexander had a bad qualifying run here, had a flat tire when he qualified, so he started. He had to take a provisional spot, as a matter of fact, to get in the race. Ford Haviland race cam uh, showing us Davey Allison. Now, the situation is our helicopter, which transmits this picture, has to fly very low this afternoon because of the low ceiling that we have here, and therefore our camera pictures from in-car are not very good at this point. Hopefully the ceiling will be rising a little, and the helicopter will be able to get higher in the air. There you can see it's just hovering uh, really a few hundred feet over uh, the speedway. So our pictures aren't real good at this time. We have an in-car camera with Davey Allison, and we also have one in the Rick Mass car. And we're 
really uh, anticipating some good stuff from Rick Mast. If he can perform like he did at Daytona, he's going to be a real challenger in this 500-mile race. Let's go down to Jackaroot for another report from Pit Road. Well, we have a problem with the microphone now, possibly because of the moisture that is uh, on the ground and hanging in the air here. So we will try to get down to Jack for a report just a little bit later. You can see the cars circling the racetrack at slow speed under caution before uh, we can get a green. We have to dry out this track just a little more. And these race cars will dry it out in a hurry. As you mentioned, they've had safety vehicles out on the track for a couple of hours, but these cars with heat coming off the exhaust will dry it out very quickly. And now let's go back to Pit Road and Jack Root. Well Ned, well, Ned, what you're looking at is a picture of me coming from Jimmy Maycar's head. You see, what we're going to be unveiling today for the first time is what we're going to call the crew cam. Now, this camera is breaking up just a little bit, but that's because he's going to be moving around. But you can see all of the low ceiling that we've got the helicopters down. But here is the camera facility right here, a little microphone. And, Jimmy, you're going to give us a bird's eye view of what it's going to be like, especially on those right side tire changes. Yeah, I hope it, uh, it works real well because... Uh, this will be a view that most fans never get a chance to see, and it should be real exciting. Well, hopefully, too, if my camera starts to go on the fritz, I can just come up to you, and we can still get the reports done. But we'll take a, let's take a look around at your pitch. Just kind of look around, and we can show the people just how this is going to operate. Now, you'll be going a little bit faster than that when you go to change those right-side tires. What about the weight and the fact that you know that now millions of Americans are going to be watching what you do? Any extra pressure? <laughs> no, not really. I think once the car comes down pit road, I'm going to forget all about this thing being on my head. What I want to know is I've got one of these type of antennas. Guys, how could I get one like this? This is a little neater. It looks kind of like maybe you're going to go talk to Alf up in Melmac a little bit later. But good luck to you today, Jimmy, and some really historic pictures that hopefully will bring to our ESPN viewers. Bob, back to you. We made Flat Nose the Dog rather famous from Darlington uh, a couple of years ago, and now I guess we can call Jimmy Flathead with that antenna that's uh, up there. <laughs> well, Jimmy's been in the limelight a little bit this winter. He was uh, one of the members on the first team of the all-pro Copenhagen Skull all-pro team last year for the right front tire changer and he was inducted into the TRW Mechanics Hall of Fame during Daytona Speed Weeks this year. Well you can see that the race is officially on. We now begin counting the laps. We are under a green and caution situation again trying to get the track just a little bit drier before we turn them loose at high speed. Bob Jenkins uh, I gotta ask you I yeah. saw you did the opening just a little bit ago what was with all the bugs? I mean, is it... Well, you, what, when you got hair, do you have to use hairspray and it attracts <laughs> the bugs or what? I did take a shower this morning, so it can't be that. I don't know. <laughs> but I'll tell you, there was a huge swarm of uh, gnats or something up there. And uh, Well, Ned and I didn't have any problem down where we well, were. Well, you were down in Victory Lane, though. I was up on top of the uh, grandstand here or where that camera was. So they were just hibernating up there. I guess so, yeah. Maybe it's warmer <laughs> take, up take there. Take Bob off the hook, Okay, well, the field uh, now moving through corner number four, about to complete lap number one. There is Jody Ridley, who patiently waits for the opportunity to jump in the Bill Elliott car and compete for the rest of the race. Decisions are being made now as to when we will be able to go to a green situation. There you can see Ernie Elliott conferring with the NASCAR officials, and they're just deciding when the track is going to be ready to go. Yeah, I was wondering when they would be able to make that change. The green flag has come out now, and uh, that's the rule is that you can't change drivers until the green flag has been displayed. It now has been displayed, even though they're still running caution and green, so they'll make that decision. So Bill may be coming in here very shortly to uh, make the driver change. The green is on. Let's uh, go down to Jerry Punch. Maybe he can update us on that. There was a lot of discussion this morning in the garage area about the green flag rule as far as driver changes. Now, they had changed the rule so that a driver who was injured could not get in a car and run one lap, and then uh, someone else get in and drive all the races, and the driver who didn't run but uh, maybe 50 laps all year long would win the NASCAR championship. Well, they've changed the rule so that you have to take the official green flag, which means a green flag under speed. So apparently the driver change will not be invoked here during the green-yellow period. They will wait until they run these laps under green-yellow, then go to full green and wait for an official first caution flag before they make the driver swap. Okay, so we will see racing conditions before Bill Elliott comes in for relief from 
uh, Jody Ridley. And there is our crew cam on the head of Jimmy Maycar. We'll be back with more, hopefully, the start of this 500-mile race at Rockingham after these messages. Back at Rockingham, where four laps of this 492-lap race have been completed, all under the caution because of a wet racetrack. And gentlemen, I tell you, like I said, they had the trucks out there at 9 o'clock this morning, and they've had the cars now encircling the track for, well, actually, more than four laps. And it isn't drying very quick, is it? Well, there was a lot of moisture in the racetrack as a result of it raining most of the night here at the North Carolina Motor Speedway. But I think the safety vehicles they put on the track early this morning as well as the tires that they had behind some of those vehicles started the drying process but many of the the exhaust off of these cars as low as they are to the ground will help dry it quicker than anything i think that's exactly right because they have 42 race cars and the safety vehicles they had going around a little bit ago what they have 10 or 15 vehicles now they have 43 counting the pace cars so i think you're right the race cars are what they need to draw off the racetrack Let's see if we can contact Rusty Wallace here on the radio to see how things are out there. Rusty, this is Bob Jenkins. You hear me? Yeah, Bob, I got you going in. Rusty, uh, how close are we to going green here? Is the track really that wet? Yeah, it's real wet right now. We're probably at 15 laps away, I'd say. Does this change you guys' strategy in any way? You're wasting fuel in there under caution. Uh, does it involve uh, strategy in any way? Man, I ain't got much strategy, and it's not really hurting us any because we're really, you know, we got to get better fuel as well as we're doing under the caution, though. We wouldn't be in the green, so just the weight is the, the only thing that's getting there. I think I want to get going. You confident that you can uh, pull off a victory here this afternoon? Pretty confident. If I don't have any problems, this car should run strong all day. All right, we'll be watching. Good luck to you. Okay, thank you very much. Bob, one problem that these cars have is running slow for such a prolonged period as they are right now is fouling spark plugs. Because the spark plugs in these cars are so cold to be able to accept the 8,000 RPM and the 1,200 degrees that they get that a, a low RPM like they're doing right now is very, very difficult to keep them from the gasoline just simply fouling them out. You'll see some of the guys once in a while fall back and and nail the car in second gear. What they're trying to do is turn more RPMs and get the RPM up level to and get the plugs warmed up to where it'll burn away some of that excessive fuel. I saw Daryl Walter yep. doing just a couple of minutes ago. Right. And Benny, I'm sure that some fans wonder, well, would the same thing not apply during the race when they run a long caution? But the engine has already been heated up to that 1,200 degrees or whatever it is then. That's a good point, Ned, is exactly right, because right now they just started them up down on the pit road and they're not up to operating temperature and won't be until they run them at hard green flag racing for a four or five laps. Well, Davey Allison uh, was relegated to uh, the back of the pack because of missing the driver's meeting uh, this morning. And we have our Fort Hamlin race cam looking at him right now. Davey, this is Bob Jenkins. You read me? We're looking at you from our uh, Ford Havilon race cam. Uh, track uh, drying out there is still a pretty slow process. have to start now from the back of the pack because of the fact that you missed the driver's meeting this morning. Uh, does that mean that you change your driving strategy? Well, what it means, Bob, is that we're just going to have to be really careful out here and pick our way through the traffic, try to stay out of trouble and be around at the end of the race. Uh, this race is 492 laps long, and it's a pretty long time. It'll take about four and a half hours to run, so that ought to be plenty of time for us to make up the distance. All right, we'll be watching. Best of luck this afternoon. Thank you, and I'd like to say hi to my mom and dad back home and all the family, and just tell them that we've been thinking about them, and we'll be on the bar to see them. And we also send our best wishes to Bobby Allison and family. I'm sure Bobby's watching I'll that. B.A., you feeling okay? <laughs> So still, uh, no green flag conditions, although the race has been started. We are now completing lap number nine. The pace car is going to pick up the pace just a little bit so that the cars will have a better opportunity to see how they're going to, uh, to run the track with its a little bit wet. And of course, the higher speeds will uh, drive the track a little quicker, too. 
Jimmy Maycar still checking notes down there in Rusty Wallace's uh, pit area. He's wearing our crew cam, and the helicopter still hovering over the speedway, not get to, not able to get very high into the sky because of the low ceiling that we have here this afternoon. So we'll take another break while we are under a yellow condition here at Rockingham and be back with more in just a moment. At North Carolina Motor Speedway in Rockingham, the Goodrich 500 has begun, however, under caution. We have completed 12 laps of the race, and the reason we are under caution is because the racetrack is still a little wet, but it is drying quite rapidly, and we should be going green within the next few laps. In the meantime, let's go to the pit area and Jerry Punch. Well, Bob, actually, we're down here in what they call Spotter's Row. Now, in the NFL, the coaches have uh, offensive coaches in the press box. Here in racing, they have spotters here on Spotter's Row. And normally, the spotters are on top of these trucks behind me here in the garage area. But as of this race, NASCAR has mandated no one else on top of the trucks. That's for safety so they can keep everyone off the trucks. And NASCAR and the flagman can see all the way around the racetrack. Now, we're scanning along. All the spotters, one from each crew, is on top of this platform here. A lot of familiar faces. One you're looking at right now, three times. Winston Cup champion David Pearson spotting for his young son Larry. So we're here on Spotters Row. A lot of activity coming up here. Let's go back upstairs to Bob Jenkins. All right. Uh, we've talked about and even documented how important spotters are for a race team, Benny. They are incredibly, especially at this racetrack, because as the cars go into turn one, they can't see coming off turn two. And they're going to the speed fast enough that if there is trouble coming off turn two, they can't avoid the accident. So the spotter sees the trouble in front of them and tells them, hey, there's a spin coming off turn two. So we're in the middle of one and two. They can slow down and be ready for whatever problem they might encounter. It saved so many wrecks over the years. Just an extra set of eyes for the driver. And a, a tremendous set of eyes because they can see the whole racetrack where the driver's viewpoint is just a few hundred feet in front of him. Well, let's go back down to pit road, and here's a report from Jack Aru. Well, Bob, you talked about Bobby Allison still on the vent back in his home in Hueytown, Alabama. Well, this gentleman, Mike Alexander, stepped in for Bobby last year and is driving for the Stavola brothers this year in the Miller American car. But he has stepped out of the car, and he now has a relief driver as well, Dick Trickle at the wheel. And Mike Alexander, what's the story on your condition? Well... I didn't feel very good out here because this is a physical racetrack. Daytona wasn't that bad, but, you know, after I got in it for a day, I, I, it was the toughest decision for me to ever make is to tell the guys, well, guys, I think we ought to get somebody else that can put this Miller High Life Buick up front. Now, you are still on the men from your accident back at Pensacola in December, but you did run at Daytona, and then you re-injured a collarbone there. So it seems as if you didn't have any luck, you'd have bad luck still. Well, I'm just ready for this bad dream to be over, you know. This is something I want to do all my life, and uh, it's just a minor setback. Well, a short track ace Dick, Dick Trickle will be driving the car today, and we are on the back pit area. Normally, this is where the back markers are, but listen to the names of some of the teams that are here. The STB team of Richard Petty, mired in the back of the field. He will be coming into the pits for service here all afternoon, and also in the back, the defending champion of this race, Neil Bonnet, now driving for the Sitco people and the Woods Brothers. He's also in the back, and hey, lest we forget, Bonnet came from 30th position to win this event one year ago. So there'll be plenty of action here on the back pits as well, Bob. All right, thank you, Jack. This track is still a little wet. They're picking up the pace a little, but we're still not under the green condition. Now, let's talk about the back pits. Is there an advantage or disadvantage or nothing regarding where you pit here? There is an advantage pitting on the back straightaway. Well, it depends on where the pace car comes out. And, to, and yesterday they used it in turn one, so I'm assuming that they're going to use it there again. Oh, Ned tells me he was at the driver's meeting today, and that's where the pace car is going to be, entering turn one. So what happens is if the leaders come by and take the caution flag, and the pace car pulls out in front of them, they need to, when they go in the back straightaway pit, they're able to pit before the leaders and get out on the racetrack before the leaders and, take, and assume the lead simply by being able to pit on the back straightaway. Okay, we've got five more laps to go, and we will be going green. So the Goodwrench 500, although it is underway, will be going to a race condition in now less than uh, five laps. So let's now look at the way they are running at the end of 16 laps, and this is the way they are going to start the race with Rusty Wallace, Darrell Waltrip, Ken Schrader, Mark Martin, and Rick Wilson 
the top five, and the second five, Jeff Bodine, Bill Elliott, Harry Gant, Brett Bodine, and Rick Mass. So when we come back, we should be near race conditions at the North Carolina Motor Speedway. And there is Davey Allison into the pit area trying to refuel the car, but uh, I don't know whether they got any in it or not. I don't know, but the NASCAR official was motioning him to go on, so apparently they were not going to permit him to do that. He was already in the rear, so he had nothing to lose. If right. someone else tries that, well, they would have something to lose. Four more on that. Let's go to Jack Aruba. Well, Ned, if that's the case, then we've seen the first advantage of pitting on the back pits because Dick Trickle did the same thing, brought his car, the Miller American Buick, onto pit road, and they did put in a can of gas. So they've gotten away maybe with a little bit. That's pretty. I'm impressed by those guys <laughs> thinking to stop sure. after 20 laps on the caution, and they're starting in the last row, so it, mm -hmm. they lose nothing. Right. Very good thinking on the part of Robert Yates and Ronald Perrier, the uh, respective crew chiefs. Despite the fact that the weather is not good here, not only is it uh, hazy and kind of drizzly and rainy, but the temperature isn't all that great either. However, the crowd here is just tremendous. Yesterday, when we didn't have a whole lot better weather, there was a great crowd on hand for the Bush Grand National Race that we televised for you here on ESPN that was won, by the way, by Rob Moroso. But today, the fans have come back out, and now they are standing and cheering and getting ready to start the Goodrich 500 under green conditions. And we have completed 21 laps, so when they come by to complete lap number 22, we'll be underway. 492 make up this event. If this race today is as good as that race yesterday, yeah. and being twice as long, we'll never make it. We'll have to have relief <laughs> announcers. <laughs> the fans don't go away. Stay with us. Dale Earnhardt and Harry Gann battled wheel to wheel uh, throughout a lot of the race, and... Uh, then Harry Gant was black flagged, and Rob Moroso ended up as the winner. The pace car pulls off the track, and we are set to go for our first live coverage of the NASCAR Winston Cup race in 1989. We're under green. Still remaining side by side, the front row, Rusty Wallace and Darrell Waltrip. It is Wallace that has the slight advantage. There's the number 25 of Ken Schrader running in third position. It's Wallace, Darrell Waltrip, and Ken Schrader. They're going to be sort of tiptoeing through these turns uh, on these first few laps because there is still a few wet spots out there. I tell you what, you can tell that Darrell Waltrip is pumped up because, you know, two years ago, Waltrip would stay in there and run alongside Rusty Wallace on a wet racetrack the first lap. But he says, hey, I am back. Look at me go. I was impressed. Wallace, and then Darrell Waltrip, then Ken Schrader, Mark Martin is running in four spot, then Rick Wilson, Jeff Bodine, Harry Gann, and Bill Elliott, as the battle right now is for third position. That's Mark Martin in the blue car number six, who was down to the inside just a moment there with uh, Ken Schrader in car number 25, but now they are in single file formation. The number 28 car on the outside there, running next to the 52 of Jimmy Means, is Davey Allison, who started in the back of the pack, but he is moving up fast already. He has already picked off about 10 cars back there, Bob, so it is, uh, it is moving well. And there is the view uh, through the back glass of that uh, Haviland Ford, Davey Allison. You can see Richard Petty there on the right side of your screen of the STP Pontiac. He, too, had a miserable qualifying run and had to start in the back of the pack. But as Ned indicated, we can watch for him to move up steadily. He had something to happen in qualifying that I had never seen or heard of, Bob. The spring deformed when he was right rear spring when he went into the first turn, and it didn't come back, and it almost took him into the wall. But yesterday in the late practice, he was running very well. I think we will see him come up towards the front. All right, as we have the view of Davey Allison, let's talk a bit about running on a racetrack under these conditions, Benny. You know that it's not completely dry. Do you just hold your breath and go for it? That's about all you can do because you know that when you go down the corner, the tires are just not going to grip like you're accustomed to them gripping because the racetrack is wet. We see Davey Allison going by the Ken Bouchard automobile. In Daytona, in 1979, they started the race when it was about like this. There we see Mark Martin trying to take third place away from Ken Schrader, Schrader and he got him. He did. So Mark Martin in car number six is in third position now. Schrader back to fourth, and Rick Wilson is right there also. Also the yellow and white car number five of Jeff Bodine as they run in pretty much single file formation. And the lead held by Rusty Wallace. He has separated himself from Darrell Walter by 
about uh, 15 or 20 car lengths. Here is Dale Earnhardt in car number three going to the inside of the 75 car driven by Morgan Shepard. Right behind. Oh, look at Dale. Looks like he got the rear end of that car out a little bit. Yes, he did. He got just a little bit loose. That's Morgan Shepard in the car, the Valvoline car up in front of him. And you see Greg Sachs in the Crisco car down on the inside. Earnhardt went high and it uh, cost him a few positions. Still in Marla there, car number 94. We're watching from the Hydra Race Camp by right Rick Mast. I don't know if Rick Mast has ever seen any pictures like this before, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty exciting for a fellow that's running his fourth race Cup race ever. Tri-Oval once again, completing another lap. 30 laps have now been completed. Now Rick Mast moving to the inside, or at least is right behind the uh, Valvoline car of Morgan Shepard. Mark Martin making a move on Darrell Walter, coming off turn four. This is for second spot. So Mark Martin showing some early strength here. He passed Ken Schrader a couple of laps ago. Now he is challenging Daryl Walsh with car number 17 for second, and he takes second position. Mark Martin in this 12 line for car number six has second. Walter now back to third, and uh, Schrader is behind him. And now a battle developing between the number nine car of Bill Elliott and the 11 of Terry Labonte. And this would be for eight spot. I tell you what, that's pretty impressive what Bill Elliott is doing with one hand out there, Dan. Yeah, at this racetrack, as difficult as this racetrack is with one hand. You know, Mike Alexander got out of his car, he told Jack Root just a moment ago, because it's a physical racetrack. And Bill Elliott's doing it with one hand. But he's not going to be able to do it for long. Yeah, he would like to see a caution, I'm sure, as Alan Kowicki moves up and makes it a trio now. Terry Labonte, who started in 14th place now, battling for eighth, having a good run here in the early going. Seven. Alan Kowicki was in a position to win this race last year, did not pull off the victory, but he did later win, of course, at Phoenix for his first Winston Cup victory. Great side-by-side -side racing between Terry Labonte in number 11 and Bill Elliott in car number 9 as Kowicki watches. And look at those two cars as uh, Labonte and Elliott may have touched there coming off of corner number 4. I think we're going to see lots of that today touching as they come off these corners because we can see the Labonte on the inside has the advantage, but yet he can't use the whole racetrack, so therefore unable to get by Bill Elliott. Here comes Dale Earnhardt into the mix, meanwhile. He has sneaked right up on the back bumper of the Xerox Ford of Allen Kowicki, and also joining the hunt is the 88 of Greg Sachs. So what was a two-car battle now becomes a five-car mix-up. And here is Kowicki going to the inside of Bill Elliott now at corner number two. And Kowicki, a little sideways coming off the second corner, but he regained control. Whoa. Nice, nice move by Alan Kowicki as he saved it after it was almost sideways. I tell you what, these guys need to get in line because Rusty Wallace, the leader, is checking out. They need to get in line, use the whole racetrack so they can run a little bit faster. Rusty Wallace has opened up a considerable lead over second place Mark Martin. Third place is uh, Ken Schrader, then fourth is Darrell Waltrip, followed by Harry Gant, Rick Wilson, Jeff Bodine, and there is the group of cars running third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. Schrader, Waltrip, Harry Gant, Rick Wilson in car number four, Jeff Bodine in five. Also there is the number 26 Quaker State driven by Ricky Rudd, and the number 15 car of uh, Brett Bodine. Very exciting, but as I said, our leader has checked out. Bo Nine running a very high line early on in the race. Uh, is making some headway by doing it, but it's extremely high for this early in the race. Well, especially with some wet spots up there, but uh, the track is drying very quickly now as they're up to speed, so I think Danny, that's perhaps not a concern for them now. Darrell Walter is really off the pace right now. He's backed up to about six spots, but we got six spots right now, and um, the car just isn't handling or he's got some other look how high he goes that time yeah i think the car is uh, maybe a little loose and he's chasing it. so brett bodine number 15 dives to the inside of daryl waltrip and challenges him for the sixth position but on the other hand you gotta remember that daryl wasn't real anxious to uh run up front in the uh, early part of the daytona 500 either this is a long race and as long as he can keep the leaders in sights daryl may be just cooling it for the moment well he just might be 
although the car is sliding high on the racetrack in both of the corners. Let's go down to Jackaroo. Let's give you the report on what is actually happening with Darrell Waltrip's car. Benny Parsons, you're indeed right. The car is very loose. I checked with Jeff Hammond, and he says, yeah, he's reported that it's loose, and it's a log race, so he says, I'm just going to back out of it for a bit. Back to you. So I guess we were both right. <laughs> His car's a little bit, uh, is handling a little bit ill handling, and you're also right. He decided, hey, what the heck, I'll just back up a little bit. No sense of taking a chance this early in the event. Just back off of the throttle a little bit and watch everybody go around, although he hasn't lost too many spots because of this. Well, there's Harry Gant, the number 33 car, 25 Ken Schrader, 26 Ricky Rudd, and the five car of Jeff Bodine as they tussle for position. Ricky Rudd in the inside now off Schrader. Rudd is looking good in the early going. Schrader a little bit high there in turn number three and lost the spot. Tell you what, Rudd looks very good on the bottom of the racetrack. And just watching the cars go around the racetrack, Ricky Rudd may be able to run on the bottom as well as anyone. The lead is held by Rusty Wallace. And the pole center jumped out into the lead when we dropped the green flag, and he has opened up quite a bit of interval between himself and second place, Mark Martin. Back with more right after this from Rockingham. Yellow has come out. It is for the number 23 car driven by Eddie Bierschwale from San Antonio, Texas, as he has spun down in turn number one. You can see the car drops to the low side of the racetrack onto the apron, out of the way of uh, the groove of the racetrack. Bierschwale now getting the car headed in the right direction under its own power, but the yellow flag is out on lap number 46. Now, we're going to see some pit stops, and we're also probably going to see Jody Ridley replace Bill Elliott. There is Bill as they come down to check, take the checkered flag. The pace car is out onto the track already. No, it's a yellow flag. Not quite the checkered flag. Oh, did I say the checkered yeah. flag? <laughs> well, not quite. We'll be there in about three and a half hours, I hope. Now, they did race back to the to the start-finish line, and Jimmy Bean, who had just been lapped by Rusty Wallace, beat Rusty Wallace back to the start-finish line, so Jimmy and his new Alpha seltzer sponsored Pontiac got to back in the lead lap, so a good move on his part. There is Jody Ridley standing by, ready to jump in the Coors Ford when Bill brings it in. We're watching the field move in turn number four now. We're also waiting for Rusty Wallace to come in for a pit stop as we have the crew cam on the head of Jimmy Maycar. The field now coming out of uh, turn number four and on the pit road, and here comes Rusty Wallace in for his stop. Not only Rusty Wallace, but every car on this road. Rusty came down here and every car on the race Look at that. some assistance in uh, getting that helmet off. Let's go to Jerry Punch, who's right there in the pit area. Well, Bill, you didn't get to come in under, under that uh, green-yellow situation and uh, make the change. You ran some laps under green. How did it feel? Well, I, I had to use my left hand more than I wanted to, and now I got tired no more than that was. You know, I just can't use my right arm enough to do what I need to do, and it just puts me in a bad situation. You told me before the race you were concerned more about the, getting the car sideways in the corner. You wouldn't be able to save it. I know you had to have a few anxious moments when Kowicki got sideways in front of you over in turn two. Well, that really didn't bother me because I was, st I was still going straight, and that's all that concerned me. Well, hope you get the feeling better. He's going to head back home, and Bill Elliott will climb out. Jody Ridley in it here at Rockingham. All right, so our first series of pit stops have been completed, and there is our shot from the crew cam again on Jimmy Maycar. The tire temperatures are being taken. You can see the steam, the smoke coming off of those tires. 
as Jimmy Maycar checks the tire temperatures, the ones that have just come off the car driven by Rusty Wallace. What they're doing, Bob, is they're checking the front and rear tire, trying to get the balance, trying to understand the balance that the car has as far as front to rear balance. If the right front was hotter than the rear, then a car is wanting to push or go straight toward the outside retaining wall. If the right rear was hotter, the car would be too loose. They'd have to make an adjustment. Jody Ridley came in just momentarily for another adjustment, and now he goes back out onto the racetrack. We're under our first caution because of a spin by Eddie Mearswale at the Goodwrench 500. 49 of 492 laps completed, and Larry Pearson is the leader of the Goodwrench 500. Dale Jarrett runs second, followed by Mark Martin, Morgan Shepard, and Lake Speed. Six through ten, Rusty Wallace, Michael Waltrip, Richard Petty, Neil Bonnet, and Ken Schrader. Let's go to the pit area. Here's Jerry. Well, gentlemen, well, gentlemen when Bill Elliott came in, they did not make a tire change on the car because it was difficult for Elliott to get out of the car. They couldn't have the car up on Jack, so they were going to bring him back in with Jody Ridley in the car and put fresh rubber on the car. But now it's one lap to go to green, and they don't have time to change tires, so that car out there with used tires on. Let's go up pit road to Jack Aroon. Well, Jerry, if, even if you can change the tires, as we saw Jimmy Maycar checking the tire temperatures, Benny Parsons and Ned Jarrett, what they're finding out is because of all the water on pit road, they can't get accurate temperatures. The temperature across front and back was 150 degrees, so they don't know what the car's doing. Back to you under green. Green flag does come out, and we're back to racing. First, you got a couple fellows up front that are pitting on the back stretch. Larry Pearson and Dale Jarrett made good pit stops on the back stretch. As a result, they're up front right now. That's Mark Martin. Mark Martin pitted on the front straightaway, and he is in front of Rusty Wallace, but I don't know exactly how many tires that Mark might have changed. Maybe he only changed a couple. If, that, if he did, that's why he's up front. But he's challenging Dale Jarrett right now for the lead going in turn one. Well, Dale picks up some Winston Cup points by leading that lap. Dale Jarrett is the leader of the Goodrich 500. Second is Mark Martin. Third, Rusty Wallace. Fourth, Pearson. And fifth is Lake Speed. Now a challenge for the lead as the number six car of Mark Martin moved low on the inside of uh, Dale Jarrett there going into turn number three and Rusty Wallace also right there knocking on the door in car number 27. Jack Aroot has another report. Well, just update you whether it was two or four on Mark Martin. It was right sides only for Mark Martin. That could account for the way he got in front of Rusty Wallace. Back to you. All right, he does have the lead, but he's suffering because of it right now because he only changed two, Rusty changed four. We saw with Jimmy Maycar and his crew cam Change four tires and watch Rusty Wallace. It's even alive off the corner. New tires, especially here at Rockingham, are very, very important. And on every corner of the car, each one helps a little bit. We might mention that uh, Goodyear had uh, all the starters in this race. Hoosier tires not performing, apparently, like everyone had hoped. But we did have one of the top drivers that went to Hoosier tires during this pit stop under the caution, Kenny Schrader in the Folgers Coffee Chevrolet. So we'll see how he does after he runs a little while. I'm surprised Mark Martin is able to keep Rusty Wallace behind him. I thought Rusty was just blown by, but Mark Martin yesterday had the fastest car here and had a mechanical problem. Today, he may have one of the fastest cars today, and that's Rose Light Ford Thunderbird. Here comes Rusty on the inside now as they come off turn four. And they cross the stripe, and Rusty may have had the lead by about a bumper, and now he does. They complete the pass and goes into the lead once again. So Rusty Wallace reassumes command of the Goodwrench 500, dropping Mark Martin back to second. Dale Jarrett is still third. Fourth is uh, Lake Speed and Fifth is Richard Petty. He started 39th. Ned told us to be aware of him, but indeed you hit it on the head, Ned. Ned, he is fifth right now. I'll tell you, he's running very well. Of course, he's another of those drivers that was sitting on the back stretch, but even before the caution came out, he was moving up through the pack. And uh, I think Richard Petty is in for a good run. One more race is here at the North Carolina Motor Speedway than any other driver certainly knows his way around here. I tell you what, he just passed Dale Jarrett for fourth spot. And the fans applauded just like Rusty, they did Rusty Wallace when he took the lead from Mark Martin. The King still has a few fans around. No question about that. We had several drivers, as a matter of fact, switch from Goodyear to Hoosier during that first caution period, including the number eight car of Bobby Hillen. Neil Bonnet, the defending champion of this race, has also moved into the top ten in car number 21, the Wood Brothers Ford. Neil is another of those drivers pitting on the back stretch, and as Benny Parsons want, pointed out, that can be an advantage. It was definitely on this past caution period. 
Others that switch to uh, Hoosiers on the uh, pit stops include the 75 car of Morgan Shepard. We mentioned Ken Schrader and also J.D. McDuffie. Number uh, 51 car of Butch Miller apparently has gone behind the wall. To, uh, the situation there and try to get it back in the race but for the moment the 51 car of Butch Miller is behind the wall. Well things have come down here a little bit as Rusty Wallace has taken over the uh, lead once again. And he's coming up on Dave Marcus who was at the head of the pack not too long ago but Dave had a stop and go penalty apparently he jumped the flag a little bit on the restart so now he's about to go a lap down in car number 71. Dave Marcus is possibly going a lap down here in the early going. Back with more from Rockingham after these messages. We're at Rockingham, North Carolina for the Goodrich 500 Winston Cup race, being led at the moment by the number 27 Kodiak Pontiac, driven by Rusty Wallace. We go to one of our two in-car cameras. This is the scene that Davey Allison has. The Ford Hamilton race cam providing the pictures for us. He is right behind Rick Wilson in the Kodak car. They have been going at it for several laps out there. Very tight racing. As always, folks, while we were commercial, it was really exciting because they were three abreast one time coming down the front straightaway. Rick Wilson, Davey Allison, and the car of Rodney Cohen. I think the car is running very well for him. He appears to be handling well. He was coming up through the track before that car came out. Now trying to come back up through the track. You see him move in on Rick Wilson. Also just ahead of Davey Allison and Rick Wilson. Cars have stayed on the bottom of the racetrack very well. Both Rick, Rick Wilson and Davey Allison stayed on the bottom of the racetrack. And most of all, even the leader, Rusty Wallace, was up on the high side. But these cars staying right on the bottom. And yesterday, at the Good Ranch 200 Bush Grand National Race, the cars were moving high as the race went on. The track got very slick, but had a lot of rain last night, so it washed that uh, water or the grease off the racetrack. There's Davey going on inside Rick Wilson. Looks like he's going to take that spot away as the 25 car, Ken Schrader, he switched to Hoosier tires on this last stop, but it looks like so far that is not the hot setup because uh, looks like he's holding up the field right now a little bit. Once again, some really tight competition there between Davey Allison and Rick Wilson. And there's the view from the camera mounted on the bottom the car looking up toward Davy Allison. Three. I tell you what, the competition, the cars are so equal. Oh, Davy got the car a little sideways. You see that hand go back to the right? That means he was correcting that thing. But the cars are so close anymore. Anyway. We see all those cars, there's only just a small difference in all those automobiles. Well, up front, Rusty Wallace just went around car number nine, Jody Ridley, which was started by Bill Elliott, and put that car a lap down. So Jody Ridley in substitute for Bill Elliott is a lap down to the field here with uh, 59 laps completed. What a tremendous disappointment this has to be for Bill Elliott coming off his tremendous championship season last year and having to uh, suffer because of the broken wrist that uh, really made things bad for him at Daytona and will for the next few races. One problem that Jody Ridley has is that he's not been racing the Winston Cup for a long, long time, but the biggest problem he has right now is four used tires. Just like Jerry Puncher, one of our pit reporters, reported, he has did not get a chance to change the tires. All his competition has on fresh tires, he has on used tires. He can't possibly keep up with that imbalance. So Ridley would need a caution here to come in and get some fresh tires on that car. Meanwhile, there's a separation between Jody Ridley and the leader, Rusty Wallace. In second spot is Mark Martin. Running third is Lake Speed. And in fourth position now is Richard Petty. And Lake Speed started in 25th position, now running third. Of course, uh, Petty started in 39th position and running in fourth place. So both of those drivers have made some tremendous advances here in the early going. There we see the Mike Walter car, the Country Time Lemonade Pontiac, making an unscheduled stop on the back pit. That's Darrell's younger brother. And on the front right away, Rick Mast is making an unscheduled pit stop. There, as we see the leader, Rusty Wallace, in number 27 car. So apparently 
the ace car, these cars that came in, Mama Walker and Rick Mass going out of the pits after getting right side tires. They must have cut some tires down, and they'll go at least one lap down as a result of green flag pit stop. There's Mark Martin in the Strolight Ford car number six running in second. They're actually a second, third, and fourth running very close together on the racetrack. And there's the 66 car of Rick Mast, that white Chevrolet on the bottom of the racetrack, who now is two laps down in the field because of that unscheduled pit stop. Boy, that's a tough disappointment for him because, as you mentioned, one of the stars of the Daytona 500, a, a rookie, Rick Mast. Brad Bodine in 15, Dale Earnhardt in number three, and the 21 car driven by Neil Bonnet. And that is eighth, ninth, and tenth. The full field rundown after 60 laps as we, uh, you can read how they are and we'll watch the competition for you. Some of those guys that started in the back of the pack have already moved to the front. There is Elliott, or rather, uh, I should say, Jody Ridley in the Elliott car being passed by some of the others. And so definitely those worn tires that are on that uh, Coors Ford are not allowing Jody to, Jody to run at full speed. Rusty Wallace, uh, as we see, Brett Bodine, Dale Earnhardt, he will always run higher than anyone else at these type of racetracks. And we can see that Earnhardt's getting that high groove working for him, getting some momentum off that corner. It's just a matter of time, Fred. Well, it's going to try him on the inside this time, and it looks like he's going to take measure of him, and there comes Davey Allison right on the inside, too. Davey has gotten by Rick Wilson, and as we can see, Rick Wilson right in the back of that shot, putting a few car lengths on Rick. And Earnhardt does move to that high groove once he got around. Yep. Brent Bodine, he moved back up there. He likes that. He practiced that groove yesterday afternoon. He said he's going to run that way. Let's uh, go down to the pit area and uh, have a report from Jackaroo. Well, in both cases with Bill Elliott and Rick Mass, the two fellows that we've been looking at just a couple of moments ago, behind me I talked to Ernie Elliott and asked him if it was those worn-out tires, and he said absolutely. Now, Rick Mass, who was pitting right next to him, when Travis Carter brought his team in, it was a right-side tire that was cut, and that cost them some precious laps. Back up to you. Tough break for Rick Mass who did have that fine performance at Daytona, and we had hoped perhaps that uh, he could equal that here. Now we're seeing Davey Allison in the number 28 car move to the inside of Dale Earnhardt and bid for a position there. And that was for the seventh spot. Right now, Earnhardt is holding on to seventh. The car sliding high, though, up onto the racetrack, and here comes Davey Allison to the inside, and Allison has seven spots. Oh, he just took that spot away from Earnhardt because Dale knew if he kept the foot in the accelerator, Davey was going to come on up. There was going to be an accident, and Dale Earnhardt was going to be right in the middle of it. But you're right, Nick. Davey is running very well today. You know, the car's handling well. It's coming off the corners real well, and that is a key factor here at this one-mile racetrack. If you can get the car hooked up so when you plant your foot on the accelerator, that it'll really come off of there and not get sideways with you, that can be a big advantage. This car looks to be that way right now. Some racing going on behind that group. Here is the five car of Jeff Bodine, the four of Rick Wilson, and the seven of Alan Kowicki as they are in 10th, 11th, and 12th. And Neil Bonnet right behind them. Don't get 13. And I think there's the 94 car, Sterling Marlin. He's 14. He's in the group. Kowicki on the low side of uh, Rick Wilson. Down the back stretch side by side now. The Wiki car was a little bit loose. We saw him wiggle up in the middle of one and two. And as Ned mentioned, that really hurts because you're not able to get in that accelerator the way that, see, he has to back out of the accelerator to save the car. And look where he loses all that momentum on Rick Wilson. It costs you a couple of comments when you have to do that. But he's still going to try it. He said, maybe he'll catch this time. Harry Gant at number 33. Sterling Marlin at number 94 behind uh, Neil Bonnet. And also the number 55 of Phil Parsons is in this battle and i see the 25 has fallen back behind these cars he's right behind those cars i would think that richard broom and his crew are probably thinking about going back to do the next stop because uh, this doesn't seem to be working for them as i mentioned everybody qualified on the goodyear tires uh, but as was the case sometimes last year the goodyears were the best qualifiers but maybe were not the best combination in the race and we did see several switch on the first pitch
good stop. But uh, Darrell Waltrip stayed on the good years, and he finds himself now back in 19th spot after starting in second and having a handling problem. The car just too loose in the early going and has forced him back to the uh, 19th spot. And there is Richard Petty. Has just been passed by Ricky Rudd in the car number 26, the Quaker State car of Kenny Bernstein. So Ricky Rudd on the move here. He was running very well before his tire change. He was caught back in the pack, but now working his way back up. He now has moved into the fourth position. Very fine run for Richard Petty in the first 94 laps of this Goodrich 500 at Rockingham. He has dropped back to fourth position, however. To make that fifth position, the lead held by Rusty Wallace in car number 27. The record-setting pole speed, and now he is leading this race. He took over the lead just a couple of laps after the green came out from our first caution caused by a spin by Eddie Beerschwale. We'll be back with more live coverage in a moment. You have a poor qualifying effort here at Rockingham. It's not all bad because one thing you will do is you qualify outside the top 20, you will have to pit here in the back stretch. Well, pitting in the back stretch here may be an advantage. It's already been shown over the years it will be an advantage. When the pace car comes out of a caution flag and comes out of turn two, if you're pitting back here, you can come down pit road and get service and get back on the racetrack until the field gets back around the front straightaway. As evidenced by the fact that both Lake Speed and Richard Petty pitting on the back stretch are now going in the top five. Gentlemen. 75 car driven by Morgan Shepard is making a second pit stop. He came in just a few laps ago and now is in once again. And he took on all four tires the other time, Bob, and they came back in and changed the right side tires this time. So something's wrong there. Evidently there's something wrong or possibly once in a while the air wrench doesn't tighten the lug nuts in the way they should. He goes out on the racetrack, has a vibration, and has to come back in. Here comes Jody Ridley in for a stop. We've been mentioning the fact that he has some worn-out tires on that car, and he was just going nowhere, so the crew has elected to bring him in and get some fresh rubber on that car. And I see Ernie back there adjusting the left rear, putting some bite in it. Boy, he keeps turning. Boy, he lost the wrench. And what he's doing is, is screwing the left rear spring down which as you say puts more weight on that left rear wheel to give him a little more traction off the turn let's go to jack Aruch. it's indeed what they were doing gentlemen they were trying to get some more wedge in the car ernie elliott has completed his task they changed all four tires all the way around in 28.7 seconds and that's costly for them because they'd already gone one lap down let's go back to you but he does have the fresh rubber on and now that car should be able to run at a much faster pace. Well, he'll be at least two laps down now, so it's going to be tough for him to make that up. There's our leader, Rusty Wallace, who's continuing to lead this race over second place, Mark Martin, and third place, Lake Speed. Hey, well, right behind the second, there's a race for second place. And 27 car, Rusty Wallace, the leader, stayed on the bottom of the racetrack. Here is Dale Earnhardt in number three, Terry Labonte in number 11, and Jeff Bodine in car number five, and Labonte seems to be losing ground. Now he's coming back on the inside. Looks like he might not, lose, might not be losing so much ground. Let the two Chevrolets do motor on by the Junior Johnson Ford. Second, third, and fourth position now also being contested. Here is the number six car, the dark blue one of Mark Martin, then the 26 of Ricky Rudd, and the 83 of Lake Speed. So Rudd may be among the faster cars on the racetrack. He has now gone into third position in that Kenny Bernstein prepared car. And he's got his eyes on Mark Martin. He has really been, the last 10 laps, Rudd has probably been the fastest car on the racetrack. He was caught pretty far back in the pack after his pit stop. He must have been at least 15th position and now has moved up to third and challenging for second place. So his car is working very well. So many good runs last year by Ricky Rudd and this team, but they seem to have problems in the very late going of several races. And there were many people that were saying that this year things were going to be a lot different because of uh, the Lou La Rosa joining the team. And many are picking Ricky Rudd to be a contender for the Winston Cup. You see the 84 car, that's driven by Dick Trickle. He's off the pace as well, not able to stick in the corners very well at all. He went extremely high in that corner. And Ricky Rudd taking some evasive action there to get on the outside of the number 20 car, driven by Dave Mater, the third. 
white car number 20. Meanwhile, while Rudd and Mark Martin and Lake Speed have been doing the racing, Bob, Rusty Wallace has not pulled away. He's had a clear racetrack other than the traffic, but he's not pulled away. So I think if Ricky Rudd can get by the six, we're going to see something very exciting. You can see there isn't all that much racetrack between uh, Rusty Wallace in the lead, Mark Martin in second, and Ricky Rudd in third. Here they come blasting off corner number two down the back stretch. So indeed, we're going to have a real battle here within moments. Look how both of them stand on the bottom of the racetrack. And not many cars are doing that right now. They're just getting higher and higher. Let's see how they do down in turns one and two. Went on the bottom. Both of them staying. Look at Rudd. He stayed below the, and he's got his wheels on the apron coming off turn two. There's not many cars can do that at this point in the race. Mark of a good handling race car. No question about that. Sneaking up on Martin a little bit, coming off corner number four here on the trioval. Trying to pull alongside, not able to do so. Now let's see what he does going into turn one. Rudd will try to get to the inside of Mark Martin. Martin slides a little bit high in turns one and two, and it looks like that Rudd may have it. Yes, he does. Ricky Rudd moves to second. See, that is a, a situation I was talking about just a moment ago. But Mark Martin realized he could probably have stayed outside of Ricky Rudd, and they could have raced. But if they had done that for two or three laps, Rusty Wallace would have gotten a two or three second advantage. So Martin said the best thing I can do is fall behind Rudd and let us go to the front and catch Rusty Wallace, the leader. Now back in 11th, 12th, and 13th, we have the number four car, the yellow one driven by Rick Wilson, the seven car of Alan Kowicki, and the number 33 machine driven by Harry Gann. That's Eddie Beerswell also there in car number 23, but of course he is down laps. He brought out our first caution of the afternoon. Wilson and, uh, and Alan Kowicki, 11th and 12th. Alan Kowicki, I thought, would run much better on this type of racetrack. I thought he would be a Ricky Rudd or Mark Martin at this point. And that's not to say that he won't before the day's over. Very intelligent man. And he sets up his own cars. He knows what he wants. He'll be making changes all day. Ricky Rudd has caught Rusty Wallace and about to pass him as they go into turn one in heavy traffic. For the lead, Larry Pearson is the car ahead of Rudd and Wallace. Let's see how things shake out here. Ricky Rudd is going to go into the lead. Rudd has taken over command of the Good Race 500, dropping Rusty Wallace back to second, Mark Martin to third. There they are, one, two, and three. They're trying to lap the number 16 of Larry Pearson. And now Wallace is uh, going to lose second place, it appears, as Mark Martin goes motoring around. His car is either extremely loose all of a sudden, or he's got tires going down. His car, you could saw, is wiggling badly in the corner. Yeah, before he was able to keep it on the low side of the racetrack, and now he is not able to. With Ricky Rudd going into the lead, we have had six lead changes among six different drivers. And Rudd is just pulling away from everyone. Oh, well, that car, look at him on the inside of Bobby Hillen as he comes up to put a lap on him and just moves in with the greatest of ease. Stays down on the inside and moves right around. Dale Jarrett's next. See Rusty Wallace and Mark Martin. Now Rusty seems to run on the bottom of the racetrack and is keeping up with Mark Martin. Well, maybe he just got over a little, a little over excited when, when they moved around him there, caught him in that traffic, and decided not to take any chances, settle down here and uh, get that thing back in a straight line, and say, hey, it's a long way to go yet. Though, because Rusty was really pulling away from everybody in the early laps of this race, and now things aren't quite going that way. Maybe Jack Root can update us on what the situation is. Well, Bob, one man's meat is another man's poison. Ricky Rudd and his team have had absolutely no problems. In fact, they have made no changes whatsoever since the start of the race, and the racetrack has come to them. In the case of the Kodiak team and Rusty Wallace, I checked with Barry Dodson, and his answer was, we're fine. The track is just getting a little bit away from us. So you'll see Rudd maybe holding on to the setup, and the next pit stop, the Wallace team making some adjustments, possibly in the stagger department. Back to you. All right, let's explain the track going away or well, not coming to them. Yesterday, uh, they ran for the practice. They practiced an hour after the Bush Grand National race, and they adjusted the cars as best they could. But it's rain it rained last night, and today was an unusual racetrack. They didn't really know what to expect. 
and therefore it was a guess as to what to do this morning. All right, Ricky Rudd has now gone into the lead and is pulling away from everybody as Mark Martin runs second, followed by uh, Rusty Wallace in car number 27, and we are approaching the 110 lap mark here at the Goodwrench 500, 492 laps will complete this race, and we'll be back with more after this from Rockingham. The Quaker State Buick. Um, Ricky Rudd is in the lead, and look who he is just about to lap. The 17 car of Daryl Waltrip. There he goes to the inside, and Daryl Waltrip goes a lap down. There are now 19 cars on the lead lap. Well, he made it look easy, didn't he, man? He sure did. It's nice to have a race car that's driving as good as that one looks like he's driving right now. He was the same way last fall in the North Wilkesboro race which was seen here on ESPN. The car was handling just as well. He did not win the race. He got in a situation with Dale Earnhardt, but today he is really handling. Dale Jarrett is in the pits, and Jerry Punch reports. Unscheduled stop for the Hardy's Pontiac for Dale Jarrett. Apparently they had a tire going down. A number of cars have come in back here. Remember, Mike Walker made a start with a tire going down. One car roughly get into it on the front straightaway, car number 57, that's Hutt Strickland, as they continue to work here on the Hardy's Pontiac. A four-tire change for the Hardy's crew for Dale Jarrett. We have no yellow yet because Hutt Strickland has dropped the car to the low side of the racetrack, and he is pitted on the back stretch, so he is going to uh, be able to make it to the pit area. And there is Dale Jarrett, the Hardy's Pontiac, pulling out of pit road. Meanwhile, coming in with a very badly smoking race car is Hutt Strickland in the Heinz number 57 Pontiac. Of course, he was one of uh, eight rookie drivers in this race today. Actually, nine with Dick Trickle starting the car for Mike Alexander. A lot of rookies this year and a very good rookie crop. And Ricky Rudd is working some heavy race traffic out there as he continues to lead this race. Mark Martin, in working that traffic, he's enabled Mark Martin to get just up right behind him. Dale Earnhardt coming into the pits. Look at the right rear tire is pit stop coming. Looks like the tire is bad when he comes in. Won't be too long until they'll be making scheduled pit stops, but this is unscheduled for Dale Earnhardt. The Richard Childress world champion, Unical pit crew champion, will change the right side tires and he'll go a lap down. Indeed, he does go a lap down as Ricky Rudd flashes by the Richard Childress, Kurt Shelberty crew working on the Dale Earnhardt car. Change that flat right rear tire and the work is completed. Earnhardt goes back out on the race track. The group that he has been running for the last few laps, he and Jeff Bodine both right to the top of the racetrack. It's so easy to get a flat tire up there. There we see the flat tire. But it's so easy to get in some debris up there and get a flat tire. Not much rubber on these tires, and it doesn't take a great deal to cut them when they pump them up to the right front, I guess, about 60 pounds, the right rear, about 45 to 50. And uh, it's easy to get cut. Back to the leader, meanwhile, Ricky Rudd. Here he is, coming out of corner number four into the area here in front of the grandstand, completing lap number 121. Now, there is Mark Martin, who is still not very far behind the uh, car of... Ricky Rudd. Jack Aroot will uh, examine that tire that just came off of Dale Earnhardt's car. A little bit of remedial racing here for you, gentlemen. Take a look. This is what we call a cut tire. A piece of debris actually punctured the tire and it deflated. Costly for Dale Earnhardt. Back and up to you. Now look at this. Mark Martin is challenging and indeed going into the lead. Is there something wrong with Ricky's car? Looks like he has slowed down. There's Daryl Jarrett with those new tires moving around him. Of course, Jarrett is picking up on Mark Martin and that's an indication of what new tires can do for you Jarrett put on four and boy he's just moving out and Rudd slowing down. So Rudd has a problem. Let's see if he comes into the pit area. We have indication that indeed he will be coming in for a stop as Mark Martin, now the leader of the race race, stays out there. But now diving off the banking in corner number four is Ricky Rudd and Jack Aroot will call this pit stop. Larry McReynolds bringing the pit board out as Ricky Rudd makes his way down pit road for the service from the Quaker State team. The report from the radio is that it's a cut tire, another flat here with one of the lead to contingent. Rudd taking on fuel. They are checking all four tires now. The pit clock is running, and this is costly for the man that was leading this event. They're changing the right side, and he's off and away Good in 11.9 seconds. 
good pit stop, less than 12 seconds for run, but it cost him dearly. But he's still a lap down. Mark Martin is coming off the second corner as we see Ricky Rudd. Now, Mark Martin going in the middle of back straightaway. Ricky Rudd just now coming off the second corner. But with the new tires, he may be able to run Mark Martin down and get himself back in the lead lap. There is the leader of the Goodrich 500 at the moment. Mark Martin from Batesville, Arkansas in the Stroll Light Ford prepared by Jack Roush and team. <laughs> There's Rudd. You can see that Rudd has passed uh, Rusty Wallace. He fell in behind Wallace when he uh, merged into traffic, but now he has gotten by, and there is some real action going on out there. We're looking out of Davey Allison's car to the 27 car of uh, Rusty Wallace as they come down through the trioval here in front of us. Of Rusty Wallace still running in second place, running in third place now. Davey Allison has moved all the way up there, leg speed in fourth, and Jeff Bodine in the fifth position. Baby Allison come off on the bottom of the race that, that time got it loose and look how much distance he lost on the racetrack to Rusty Wallace. That bright orange car to the outside of Rusty Wallace is the 10 machine by Ken Bouchard, the Bob Wilkins Racing Pontiac. Ken Bouchard was last year, 1988's NASCAR Rookie of the Year, the Sears uh, Champions Car Club Rookie of the Year. Oh, those guys are tiptoeing off their cars with these used tires. Right? Yeah, they, they really are. As they get worn down, they are really going away, the tires are. And, uh, Baby Allison comes off the corner. He pulls up on the back of Rusty Wallace, but pulling up behind him and passing is two different things. Rusty Wallace still running in second position, and we're watching Baby Allison. We're riding with him as he is in third spot and making a challenge for that second position. Pulling alongside of Rusty Wallace, as a matter of fact, but Wallace holds him off for the moment. Now we'll watch Davey work the lower side of the racetrack, and here may be a challenge for the spot. Indeed, Davey Allison has second as they cross the line, but it's still a good battle. You know, I don't know if uh, Hutch Trickle blew an engine a little bit ago. Do you think maybe some of the debris got on the racetrack and... The fellows had to cut the tires, or all of a sudden the rash had cut tires. Yeah, he quickly got it down out of the race and threw it on the apron, but he couldn't do it up there. Something might have gotten up on the racetrack, but I would come nearer thinking that what you pointed out earlier, sometimes they have to go very high in traffic, and especially Earnhardt, who's been running up high. Uh, it's, there's a lot more debris up there than there is on the lower part of the racetrack. There's the leader, Mark Martin, and the question now becomes how soon will he come in for a pit stop? These cars are definitely in need of some new rubber. Let's see, not this time. He stays out on the racetrack, but Mark Martin will certainly need a pit stop before too long. And we saw in the, just at the top of the picture there, the green car, that's Ricky Rudd. He's gained about a half straightaway. There's 28, baby, out to come down pit road. The second place car is in for a pit stop. This is how it looks today because he stops the car and the crew goes to work on it, not only changing the tires and fueling it. Let's go to Jack Aroot. Well, the leaders are going to work with a report on your leader, Mark Martin, as the service continues on Davey Allison's machine, is that they will try to run the string as far as they can, but they are calling him in next time by. So the crew is going to work as the Davey Allison crew continues to work, and he is off and away and back out. Now it will be Martin's turn to try and take up the action on pit road. There is Mark in the middle of the backstretch, and Rudd is unlapping himself, and Mark Martin is slowing down. This apparently will be the lap that Mark Martin comes in for his pit stop. Yes, indeed. Drops to the apron of the racetrack. Steve Meal and the group will be going to work on the sixth row light board of Mark Martin, who relinquishes the lead for a much-needed pit stop. And Rusty Wallace is also pitting. Here is Mark Martin. Right side tires, clean windshield, fill it up with gas. Darrell Walker coming in. And the Rusty Wallace's uh, pit stop. We're again watching from the crew cam on Jimmy Maycar's side of his head. You can see how quickly he puts those lug nuts back on and tightens them up. Two tire change, they fuel and fill it with fuel. And he goes over now to confer with Barry Dotson. Barry shakes his head. Yeah, that went pretty well. And Jimmy Maycar climbs behind the wall once again after another successful pit stop on the Rusty Wallace machine. 
There is uh, the number 83 car driven by Lake Speed, and he is not fitted, so he is the leader at the moment. And pitting right now are Phil Parsons and Perry Levine. These would be scheduled pit stops, because they've run long enough now, especially on those tires, that they want to get in and get new tires on them. But Lake Speed staying out there cruising around in the lead. He's trying to get that bullseye barbecue sauce on TV. Lake, good boy. Then he had that sponsor last year, of course. Rusty Wallace with those new tires. And boy, look at there. Just blows him off. Blake coming into the pits now. On the back stretch, Lake Speed relinquishes the lead for a pit stop. There he is in the back stretch pits. Robert Harrington, veteran crew chief, the crew chief owned that car this year. It's been a while since we've seen Robert on a regular job. He has been a consultant to many teams over the years, but now the full-time crew chief on Lake Speed's efforts. And who's in the lead of the Good Wrench 500? It's the number five car driven by Jeff Bodine, but he's going to be needing a pit stop soon. Here's the third place car of Brett Bodine at car number 15 making a stop. And coming in behind him will be the car number four of Lake Speed, Bobby Hillen just, I mean, of uh, Rick Wilson. Bobby Hillen just went out of the pits not long ago, so most of them making those pit stops. You can see both those cars now. The front red car is Brent Ladine. The yellow car is Rick Wilson. All of these pit stops are coming under a green flag situation. Lake Speed has completed the work on his car. He's back out, and now here is Richard Petty, who is in the pits on the backstretch. And the crew completes work on that car, the SDP Pontiac, back out in competition. Ken Schrader in car number 25 is in. They're changing tires on the right side of that car. Wilson, meanwhile, in the yellow uh, car number four, pulls out of the pit area. Long pit stop for Rick Wilson, and not the very long pit stop for Ken Schrader. But he was in five. But he had to put the Hoosiers back on because he didn't have time to change four tires. Almost a wreck on pit road as Greg Sachs was coming in. Sterling Marlin was coming in right behind him. And Greg almost ran by his pit, but he did get stopped and is, uh, is in the pit. And now the leader, Jeff Lodine, comes in. Jerry Punch will report. Jeff Lodine brings the lead by Garrett Chevrolet down pit road. There's Waddell Wilson with the pit board there to bring the car to a halt. And the crew will scamper over. Joey Knuckles and the crew will scamper over to change right side tires. Now, we would expect only a two-tire change here on the green. The tire is smoking on the left side. A lot of steam coming off. First can of fuel in. Second can of fuel going in. Cleaning the windshield. Signifying the tire change is complete. Small suggestion. Down and away. Good pit stop from Jeff Budai and crew. Kowicki was the leader, but now he comes in for a pit stop. Zarek Sports reaching out to a halt. Alan Kowicki, the one to the right side of the Z-Rex 4, the crew now. Paul Andrews, the remainder of that crew, trying to get that car changed and get out. Two right side tires going on. They're cleaning some tape away from the grill area in the front of the car. A lot of rubber and debris there, which has the car overheating. And you see the Harry Gant crew just behind him there. They're getting ready to bring Gant in. Now the car off for Kowicki. Good pit stop for that crew. He is down and away, and Harry Gant will make his entry on the pit road. Harry Gant did have the lead there for one lap, but he, too, comes in for a scheduled pit stop. Like everybody else, he's taking on right side tires and a tank of fuel, clean windshield, clean, clean the grill. Be sure there's nothing in there, and I'm sure that now they are handing Harry something, uh, or did hand him something cool to drink, and he's away. I don't think they waited to fill that car up, Ned. I don't think so either. I think they only put a ten and a half in that car, and that might mean something before it's over. Very definitely could. Harry Gant, nevertheless, goes back out onto the racetrack as we continue the Goodrich 500 under a green. All the pit stops have been made now, and we go back to find that the 26 car of Ricky Rudd is in the lead. Back in a moment. We are back, and some... Uh some uh, excitement there as you rejoin us as Ricky Rudd in the 84 car driven by Dick Trickle kind of traded paint coming off of corner number four. Wow, that was exciting. Let's go back just a few moments ago to the pit stop from Alan Kowicki. Now watch the right rear of the car. See the water running out of there? What is that? That's an overflow off the radiator. The car must be running a little bit warm. They put the hose back there so that it comes out in behind. front of another car and not on one of their tires. Yeah, behind his wheels. Yeah. yeah. They don't but, want to squirt on one of their wheels where they'll have a problem. They put it out the back to where someone else has a problem. That makes sense. 
you notice that also a lot of these tires that are coming off are giving off a lot of steam. Obviously, a great deal of difference between the tire temperature and the air temperature that we have here. And the temperature is only in the low 50s when we began this race. Top 10, Ricky Rudd, Mark Martin, Rusty Wallace, Davey Allison, and in fifth position at the end of 144 laps is Dale Earnhardt. Now 6 through 10, Jeff Bodine, Lake Speed, Harry Gant, Terry Labonte, and Alan Kowicki. There we see 26 has overtaken the Bobby Hillen automobile. That's a team car to the Dick Trickle automobile, the car formerly driven by Mike Alexander. And Brett Bodine right in front of well, Jerry Punch, uh, what about this overheating situation on the Allen Kowicki car? Problem? Well, that was a great pickup from the booth, fellas. You can see the, the water flowing out that rear overflow from the radiator. And when we were calling the pit stop, you can see him go to the front of the car and peel that tape off the front grill. They had placed tape on the front grill section because it's so cooler today, so much cooler today than it was yesterday. They were concerned about the engine not having enough temperature early on. Well, they... they Put that problem completely because the car overheated. They peeled the tape off, and now the temperature seems to be dropping back down. Alan Cole, crew chief Paul Andrews, everything seems to be going okay right now. There comes. So there is the uh, Alan Kowicki car back under race conditions, and there is the leader of the race, Ricky Rudd, as he approaches the 15 car driven by Brett Bodine. Ricky Rudd from Chesapeake, Virginia, leads this Goodrich 500 with about 150 out of 492 laps completed. Well, most people like to have a quiet office in which to work, and race crews are the same way. Making the garage area quiet, subject to this week's... Our crew cam on the head of Jimmy Maycar shows us that that young man doesn't rest. Uh, not only does he uh, change the tires, but he also uh, kind of cleans up things after the pit stop is over. But you see him looking towards turn four? Yeah. You don't ever want to be out on pit road at a Winston Cup race and not keep your eye at the oncoming traffic. There's the leader of the race, Ricky Rudd. Now, here is a change in third position. Already, Rusty Wallace has moved to second, and now Davey Allison in car number 28 has passed Mark Martin in car number 6, and so Davey Allison goes to third as we have the view from out back of the car from the Fort Haviland race camp. Seems like he's dropped off the pace just a little bit in the last few laps, man. Well, sometimes, you know, the, all of these drivers, when they made their green flag pit stops, only took on two tires. And some, depending on how the chassis is set up, two tires on some cars will work better than, than on others. And maybe his needed four new tires to really continue to work as well as it was there earlier. He's already been the leader of this race, Mark Martin, but now back in the fourth spot. And you got to be impressed with Davey Allison. That car has run well since the drop of the green flag. He began this race, of course, from the tail because he missed the driver's meeting. But he told us in a radio conversation we had before the green came out that he really didn't mind starting in the back because this race is 492 laps. It would take him, uh, he would have an adequate amount of time to get toward the front, and he is there. Now moving in on second place, Rusty Wallace, as a matter of fact. While we watched that by the, uh, the track back a moment ago, Jerry Punch had Alan Kowicki's car with those mufflers. The drivers were told in the driver's meeting this morning and crew chiefs that they want them, NASCAR says, we want all of you to develop a system similar to that. Let's get some of the noise down in the garage area. Very great idea. Jerry, maybe you can add even more to that. Well, actually, Robert Yates, who's the engine builder and now team owner for Davey Allison, is the one that developed that. Last year, he started putting hose pipes around the exhaust pipe there in the garage area, and it made it so much quieter that NASCAR really liked it. In fact, when Allen came out with it yesterday, Dick Beatty was so pleased that it was so quiet, you could actually walk in between the cars and hear yourself talk and think and everything going on, and it seemed like it would help so much with the noise problem, and he's made it mandatory now. So I think it's a great move, and you got to give uh, Alan, Alan Kowicki his credit for devising that little system. The 17 car of Darrell Waltrip comes in, and this has to be an unscheduled stop for him. Yeah, he had gone very high in turn three over there. I don't know if he has a flat or what it is. Uh, let's go back to Jerry Punch. Maybe he has a story. Well, apparently a left side tire going down. This could be possibly the left rear. Yeah, the left rear tire coming off. It's going down, and he is in the car revving it, and they're getting ready to send him out. Let's take a listen. When that car comes down off the jacks, the 
responsibility of the driver is to get the clutch out and nail the accelerator and get out as quickly as possible. The only problem is today you can't do that because as we can tell by the car spinning on pit road, there's still a lot of moisture on pit road and they just simply cannot get traction when they try to pit lead. So we're seeing Martin Martin, so Darrell now is a lap down. This is the fourth place car, and the third place car, and even he's has Darrell Walker for a lap down. Well, I think that makes him at least two laps down. The number six car, Mark Martin, has been falling back recently. Uh, Jack Arood, have you been able to find out what might be wrong with that car? Yes, Bob, and your assumptions up in the booth are absolutely accurate. The left side tires, which they have not changed all day, have literally gone away. I checked with Chief Steve Neal, the crew chief on this car, and he said, we just got to try and hold on. We're going to have to change four the next time in. So once again, tires playing a factor in how fast a car goes on the racetrack. You see, that's exactly what happened. He only changed two tires, but all of his competitors changed four tires. That first pit stop. So he's been out there the whole race, 156 laps now with the same left side. Our banquet race cam in the car of Rick Mast, and Rick has had his ups and downs so far in this race. He's been into the pits for unscheduled stops a couple of times, and certainly things are not going as well for him here as they did at Daytona. No, they are. He's running a good race when he's out on the racetrack, but as you mentioned, he has had a couple of unscheduled pit stops. You can see that uh, he's driving the car very smoothly. A lot of cars up in front of him, pretty well on the racetrack by himself right now. And the driver at this point of the race don't mind that many cars since they're being out there not in uh, heavy traffic, especially the circuit racetrack here. Well, that's right, Coach. They need all the racetrack to get around. They need to go in the corner on the bottom and maybe let it drift to the top if that's what the car says that it wants. We see him going on the bottom. We see him drift up the middle of the racetrack. In heavy traffic, you can't do that. And the standings will show you after 150 laps. This, of course, is the Travis Carter car, the number 66 machine that Rick Mast is driving. They are trying desperately to find sponsorship for that car. That will allow them to continue past just the first four races, which is all they uh, intended to do without sponsorship. In the well, I talked to Travis this week, and he said that he's been talking to people, and it, it looks better than it was. Uh, in other words, he's closer to getting sponsored right now than he was two months ago, but he didn't tell me that. I hope things work out for uh, the Rick Mast and Travis Carter combination because it appears to be a very good one. We've had 12 lead changes among 10 drivers so far in the first 150 laps of this race. Some of those that have led include Rusty Wallace, also uh, the number 29 car of Ricky Rudd, that, uh, 26 car rather of Ricky Rudd that led for a while. Lake Speed has been a leader, Alan Kowicki, and 33 car of uh, Harry Gant. There uh, we expand on this just a little bit more. Wallace Marcus has also been a leader, as has Larry Pearson, Mark Martin, and Dale Jarrett also led a lap. Ricky Rudd led for quite a while as uh, the current race leader. Also, Lake Speed, Jeff Bodine, Alan Kowicki, and Harry Gant. All of those drivers have led at one point in the first 150 laps. Out of race, Butch Miller dropped out on lap number 59. Hunt Strickland cut an engine here on the uh, trioval at lap 116, and Rodney Combs dropped out of competition a few laps after that. We watched that 26 car cruising around, leading the race, running a beautiful line around the racetrack. And we got to think about at Daytona two weeks ago when he couldn't outrun the soul. <laughs> I mean, he was awful in Daytona. And Dale Waltrip, who was so super in Daytona, won the race. And he's having the same problems today that Ricky Rudd had in Daytona. Just trying to find the right combination to get around the race. Things do change from race to race. There's no question about that. But that's what makes Winston Cup competition so very exciting. We're live at North Carolina Motor Speedway for our first live Winston Cup race of the year, and we'll be right back. Number 25 car of Ken Schrader is just going back out onto the racetrack after one of those unscheduled pit stops. And he made a four-tire change back to Goodyear. We mentioned earlier that he had changed to the Hoosier brand. Now he has gone back to Goodyear. Morgan Shepard is in in the Valvoline Pontiac. The Raymont crew going to work on that car, changing rubber on the right side. Fuel being added to the car on the left rear. Second can of gas is going in. Tires still being changed. Now that's completed. I believe this is going to be, yes it is, just a two-tire change for Morgan Shepard. And away he goes. Our business is going to be good here today because they're, they're using up a lot of it. Morgan Shepard had a two unscheduled pit stops just about 100 miles ago. Richard Petty comes in for a stop. 
Let's go to Jack Arood, who's been assessing this tire situation. Jack? Well, basically, the way the tire situation is evolving is just the way it has been from the, from the beginning of practice here, guys. You know, everybody thought that the Goodyear tires would work well in qualifying, but not very well during the race. Well, what they found is they're not wearing out. They're actually, just as, as Benny and Ned can react to, going away. There's still plenty of tread on them, but they're just not as effective. But what I find interesting to note is there are not a lot of cars that are opting for the Hoosiers either. One of the reasons for that, of course, is because the Hoosiers are not working as well as they had hoped. The only team that I've talked to that says, look, we're pretty pleased with the way the Hoosiers are operating is that of Neil Bonnet. Remember, he started way in the back. He's mired in the back on the back pits back there. And they made the conscious decision before the start of the race to switch to Hoosiers as soon as possible. They say it may be a slight edge, but nothing as dramatic as we saw here one year ago. Well, of course, Neil won on Hoosiers here last year. As a matter of fact, brought them their second consecutive win here as we also had a shot of Dave Major the third in the pit area. Now here is Mark Martin in car number six and Jeff Bodine in car number five as they contest the fourth place. Jeff Bodine. Yeah, he's running a little lower on the racetrack. He had been running very high. Maybe that's the only place he can pass. Get an opportunity to pass the car number six of Mark Martin. But Mark's car sliding up a little bit. Turned not too bad that time around, but seems like in turns one and two, he does go a little higher. And the number 33 car is also right there, driven by Harry Gant. The leader is Rusty Wallace. Second is Davey Allison. Then uh, Rusty Wallace. And then the sixth car of Mark Martin, the five of Jeff Bodine, and the 33 of Harry Gant. So this is fourth, fifth, and sixth right here. Mark Martin, already a leader of this race, is running in fourth. Jeff Bodine is in fifth place in the Levi Garrett Chevrolet, and then Harry Gann in the number 33 Skull Bandit is in sixth. I'll tell you what, Jeff Bodine and Harry Gann have been making up some time because I haven't been paying attention to them but just a few laps ago. They weren't anywhere around the six car, so they are must look at Harry on the bottom, and Jeff comes down. We got three abreast there for just a second. Boy, he yeah, made a good move. Jeff is going to pick up a position too. Bodine passes Mark Martin. He sort of set him up. He's falling for a couple of laps now. As Martin's car goes a little higher, Gant moves to the inside. His car is sticking down there. He's going to be able to Harry Gant looks like his car is really coming in because he made an impressive move the lap before coming off the second corner when he just turned it right there and went to the bottom of the racetrack. Oh, the leader, Ricky Buck, coming down pit road. So is this a scheduled pit stop? I don't think so. It's Ricky Rudd, the leader of the race, in with the Quaker State Buick. Let's see what the crew does. They're going to change the rubber on the right side once again. Well, there's one thing about it. They had a pretty good lead. They can stay in the lead lap if they make a good hit stop here. So they probably took that in consideration that, hey, there's no point sliding around out here on the racetrack. Let's get in, get him some new tires. He's going to be comfortable. Stay in the lead lap. I think that's a good move on their part. The pit stop was less than 14 seconds, and Ricky Rudd does give up the lead, but he's not going to lose a lap as we have others making their way down pit road, including Dale Earnhardt. As Rudd tries to pick up speed in the Quaker State Buick. Earnhardt had made a pit stop before uh, Rudd had the last time around, and so he's back in a little bit. Uh, well, he ran a little bit longer, actually, than Ricky Rudd did. I believe he's going to get four tires. He's going to change four tires. Now, that is quite a strategy to change four tires. If it stays green flag for another couple hundred miles, that's a good strategy. Unfortunately, if the caution comes out in three laps, wow. So he is going to go a lap down. See, Davey is going by the leader. Davey out going by. There's Davey. Earnhardt just leading. He's now at, what, two laps down or one? Just two more. So an interesting tire story is being played out here at Rockingham this afternoon. And all this caused really, gentlemen, by the fact that we've had no caution periods. Only one, and that was for a spin by Eddie Bierschwell. Let's go down to the pits and a conversation with Larry McReynolds of the uh, Quaker State team. Well, Larry. I understand that was a scheduled pit stop for you. Well, the first time we come in, we had a flat tire, and we didn't quite get him full. We only got him about three-quarters full. So we had us about a 14-second lead, so we figured rather than gambling, run him out of gas, get on in here and get full and going back to racing. That's the reason for the pit stop in the Ricky Rudd team. So it was more for fuel with Ricky Rudd than it was anything else, although, of course, he was uh, glad to get those new right-side tires. Now we have Harry Gann moving up to challenge the 27 car, Rusty Wallace, and Gann is having a great day. He's having a super day. This is the second race with the new team. 
Leo Jackson owns the car. Andy Petrie is the crew chief on it out of Asheville, North Carolina. Very second race. Had a pretty good run in Daytona. Finished about 10th as well. And he is running very well today. You know, another thing that, that might work well for Rex in that situation, the others are going to have to make a pit stop before we get to the halfway point when there's a $10,000 bonus for leading the at the halfway point. And the others are going to have to make a pit stop. Ricky Rudd now with new tires on his right side. That might put him in good position to collect that $10,000. Indeed, that will come from the uh, Gillette Company. The Gillette White Guard Halftime Challenge will pay the leader of the race $10,000 at that point. We're watching Rusty Wallace in car number 27 and the number 33 car of Harry Gantz. Of course, they are running in the third and fourth position at the moment. Now Gantz trying to take over the third position. He's moved on the inside of Rusty Wallace. Looks like he might have the measure of them as he starts him to turn three. Wallace comes back up on the outside, though. Pulls a half a car length ahead. He'll have the momentum coming off the turn, but Gantz car sticking well down on the inside, so they come down the front straightaway side by side. This is good racing right here, folks. Barry just can't let the car go up as much as he wants, but maybe he can stick on the bottom. No, Russ is going to have too much momentum, I think. Pretty good race, though, yeah. down the back stretch. Dead Rusty, even. Rusty does have that momentum because he carries the higher line, but I'll tell you what, that Gant car is working well for him. Here comes Mark Martin, meanwhile, in car number six to also add to the challenge. Well, hey, now get the momentum off the corner he falls back behind rusty so rusty wallace comes here with a pole position after a very very disappointing daytona 500 daytona has not been his racetrack in the past several years as a matter of fact so how close uh, what was the disappointment you have to overcome with that daytona situation well i think if we win the 500 already winning the pole has really helped us out a bunch uh, if i win the rockingham race here after the race is over, I won't even remember Daytona. It seems like when we got a big, ra big race like this under our belt, Daytona, you're there for two weeks, uh, but people forget about it pretty quick. They don't forget about the winner. Uh, the Daytona 500 winners are always re remembered, but the race itself, I think, gets forgot pretty quick. Rusty Wallace talking about the fact that, well, you can have a disappointment at Daytona, but if you win the next race, you forget about that disappointment. Let's get down to Dr. Jerry Punch in the pit area. Well, we saw Rusty Wallace backsliding, getting passed by Harry again, and we put we, Barry Dotson, the crew chief, and Barry, we're being told the tires are not wearing out, but they just seem to be giving up. Some of the drivers saying the tires are giving up. What's the problem? They have a different construction on the sidewall. The tires got more of a flex. Uh, they're going to wear for a while because of the rain. The right sides right now go about 100 miles. The left sides will go 200. We've got 145 miles on our left. Okay, that's the problem with the Rusty Wallace car. And Rusty is not doing very well at the moment as he continues to lose positions. The lead is held by Davey Allison in car number 28. Second place is Jeff Bodine, and third is Harry Gann. But right now, Davey Allison has things in hand in that Avalon Ford. Just think if Rusty Wallace has problems with his left side, the problems that Mark Martin has, because he hasn't changed all day. And he's got now 197 laps on his left side, so you know that Mark Martin is really put to around the race. Yeah, I think that's beginning to show up, too. A number of cars, Ricky Petty just went by, and uh, Barry Gant passing as we watch out the windshield of Davey Allison's car as he comes up on some lap cars. Mark Martin is definitely off the pace. In fact, he might be coming into the pits. He indeed is. Mark Martin coming into the pits right now, and he perhaps, too, will get on four new tires. There is Mark Martin charging down pit road, looking for his pit crew he finds them and now stops the car on the money jerry punch reports well steve meal robin pemberton and the rest of the strobes like we're going to work on the right side of the car most importantly they're taking those worn tires off the right side adding a second can of fuel in they're inside the car adjusting the weight there to try to put some bite in the car and now out of necessity they will have to come around and make the left side tire change four tires for mark martin a costly stop here under green Good credit to 
And I think we're going to see a lot of teams. As we said, Rusty Wallace, when he comes in, if it goes green flag, he'll be changing four tires as well. There's a leader, Davey Allison, later this afternoon on here, here on ESPN. Part two of our, actually part three of our triple header will feature the IMSA Grand Prix. Pete Halsmer has won the GTO race, by the way. Davey Allison started 41st. At the end of 60 laps, he was 16th. At the end of 120 laps, he was 5th. At the end of 200 laps, Davey Allison was and still is the leader. Quite a run from the back to the front. Well, when you think of what happened to him at Daytona, and I don't think I'll ever get over the fact that here's a guy who slides down the back and stretch grass. He hits that embankment uh, that keeps cars out of Lake Lloyd. The car overturns, and he doesn't lose a lap. Now, that, ladies and gentlemen, is really something. And besides that, he stayed out on the racetrack and got those valuable Winston Cup points that we talked about in the open. We're in Rockingham, North Carolina for the Goodwrench 500. The leader is Davey Allison, and we'll be back after these messages. Jenkins, Ned Jarrett, Benny Parsons, Jack Root, and Jerry Punch back at Rockingham, North Carolina. Davey Allison there at car number 28 is the leader. We hear, however, he's coming in for a pit stop. And indeed, he is dropping low on the banking and headed for pit road. That's going to give the lead to Jeff Bodine as he is signaling the drivers behind him. Yeah, I'm coming in for a pit stop. Now, Jack Root is right there and will explain what happens during this stop by Davey. And Robert Yates, using the jack, the crew chief, and the team owner, goes to work on the right side they're going to take the right side tires off meanwhile they are checking the condition of the left side tires as well and now they have indeed elected to make a four tire change under green and change all the way around the reason why Davey missed the driver's meeting was the fact that he had to go to mass this morning you know the Allisons are devout Catholics and now Allison is going a lap down as the leader streaks by the start finish line but Allison was off at mass and that's why he had to start 41st and now he'll be back in the back again as he goes away in 30 two seconds. So Davey Allison has a stop that lasts just over 30 seconds and he goes back out but he does go a lap down to the field and I guess Davey felt that it would be better to go to mass and perhaps get some uh, extra help than uh, to start in his assigned position for the race. I think he looks like he did the right thing. Yes, exactly his car right. is running very well today. It's paying off for him. Jeff Bodine assumes command of this race now in car number five. The Levi Garrett Chevrolet. Harry Gant is going to be in second position. There is Harry. There's a car in between first and second, one of the lap cars. Harry takes his car way up high on the banking in turn number three. There you also see Richard Petty behind uh, Harry Gant, but Richard is a lap down of the field. And the car between first and second is the number 15 car of Fred Bodine. Once again, Gant moving high on the racetrack in the corners. Very high. And folks, if you don't recognize that scene on the racetrack right now, it's called the sun. <laughs> we haven't seen it for two days, but it did come out just a moment ago. As a matter of fact, three days. It, it was uh, early Thursday morning when we last saw it here at the North Carolina Motor Speedway. Everything was rained out here on Friday. They did get qualifying in on Thursday for both the Bush Grand National Cards and the Winston Cup Cards. The second round qualifying for neither division was able to be held. And here's Rusty Wallace coming into the pits, and we'll watch that pit stop. And once again, we'll have Jimmy Maycar wearing our crew cam. Let's listen. on his on his uh, sound his microphone come on guys get the microphone going down there <laughs> so rusty wallace goes back out onto the racetrack after having made another pit stop and now he and davy allison are going to be right together on the racetrack this is going to be a little bit exciting now we're going to find out because these cars both now have tires about the same let's see who drives away from who right now on uh, the situation involving our second place competitor, Harry Gant. This is Leo 
Jackson who calls the shots for Harry Gant. And Leo, you're kind of flying blind without instruments down here. You didn't take on a full tank load of fuel during that last green flag stop, and now you're not quite sure when to bring him in. Well, we're not going to bring him in. He's going to bring himself in. Uh, our fuel pressure will, will uh, it'll start to, to vary a little bit before we run out. So what they're going to do is wait for the fuel pressure gauge to go down before they come in because they have no idea what type of fuel consumption they're getting. Wouldn't it be nice to see Harry Gant pull off a win here? It's been a long time since he was in victory lane for a Winston Cup race. He almost won the Bush Grand National race yesterday with his black flag with about five laps to go while leading because there was smoke coming from that car. And Rob Rosso, as we told you, won that race. Now here is the leader in heavy traffic. Number five, Jeff Bodine is the leader, but running here with him is the number 11 car of Terry Labonte, the 43 of Richard Petty, and the 94 of Sterling Marlin. Now Jeff is able to successfully move through that traffic and maintains the lead of the Good Wrench 500. We're glad you could join us on this Sunday afternoon for racing, and we'll be back with more after this. Cam. Uh, Jerry, let's have a conversation with him. Well, Jimmy, you're giving us some outstanding shots all the way from sweeping pit road, those dynamic dancing tire changes you've been doing for Rusty Wallace. Has this camera caused you a problem at all? No, it really hasn't. Uh, well, I'm just walking around here like that right now. I'm conscious of it, and I, and I feel it on me, but once the car comes on pit road, I guess the adrenaline gets pumping and you never really feel it. So it, it hasn't caused any problem at all. Well, you've opened a whole new spectrum for covering the pits here with a crew member carrying a camera. Thanks, thanks for the outstanding shots. But, uh, <laughs> hey, we'll, we'll say hello to the folks at home. Jimmy Maycar, of course, doing an outstanding job, the chassis man here for Rusty Wallace. And while we have it at the moment, they're getting ready to bring Harry Gant and Jeff Bodine down pit road next time by. So first and second are both coming in. The number five car of Bodine was the leader. He's into the pits, and the 33 of Harry Gant is also coming in. That's Sterling Martin, the dark, dark blue number 94, that's also coming in for a pit stop. So a lot of action on pit road as Jeff Bodine is on the top and Harry Gann is on the bottom as we watch both of their respective crews go to work. The steam coming off the tires on the right side of Jeff Bodine. They move to the left side now. They're going to make a four-tire change, as is Harry Gann. So both of these guys are going to have all four new tires on the car when they go back out onto the racetrack. Jeff Bodine's car down first. Now there goes Harry Gann out of the pit because Jeff... As Pitt is closer to turn number one, he's going to win the race out onto the track. The pit stop pretty equal, though. Both of them taking on four tires. They got out uh, just about the same time. And now, Ricky Rudd made a pit stop, I don't know, 15, 20 laps ago, 30, 40 laps ago. And he only changed two tires. And all of his competitors have made a pit stop since then and changed four. Ricky Rudd might be in just a little bit of trouble in the fact that he only took on two tires. Could be. That was 37 left to go. Now, he, uh, took on those tires. the number seven car of Alan Kowicki is the leader, and here comes Rusty Wallace in car 27. Now, he has got himself in the tail end of the lead lap. By passing Alan Kowicki, should the caution flag come out, Rusty Wallace will be able to go all the way around and make up the remainder of that lap. Kowicki in the Xerox Ford leads the race after we had both Jeff Bodine and Harry Gant come in for pit stops. The third place car was the 55 of Phil Parsons. However, he is into the pits as we continue to watch Alan Kowicki's progress on the racetrack. Phil Parsons has had a very good run here today in the Crown Skull Osmobile. has kept himself up in the top ten and top five many times. He gets the service. He takes on four tires as well. And the Alan Kowicki crew is standing out on pit road as if they're about ready to bring him in the pits, perhaps for us, some F-side tires or probably four tires. This is just a very unusual race, gentlemen, at least in my opinion. We have seen so very few caution laps, and these guys are really struggling, struggling but at least it's a changing strategy for them regarding pit stops. Well, the, the tire, depending on who has on new tires, depends on how fast they're running. Here comes Alan Kowicki, the leader, down pit road right now. His tires are getting pretty boring, so he wants to get in and get some new tires on. That'll give the lead to Ricky Rudd, but Harry Gant is passing Ricky Rudd out on the racetrack right now. We'll see what goes on with the car number seven with Jack Aru. Ricky is going to work. They're going to change all the way around. Four tires being changed. Now, while the right sides are being exchanged, one crew member is already taking the studs off, the lug nuts off the left sides, and they've gone to work now, and they've accomplished it. And let's listen as they put the tires back on on the right, on the left side. Twenty-five point three seconds.
points. That stop for Alan Kowicki. Great pit stop, changing all four tires. He did go a lap down to Ricky Rudd, though, but uh, he'll be about a lap and a quarter behind him. Rudd went around. He's going into turn three as Alan Kowicki comes off the turn two. 34 car there, driven by Rodney Combs, had to start at the back of the pack because Rudd's he had coming a crash. In. The leader is coming down pit road. He, I think they realize they're in big trouble with those used left sides out there. They said, hey, we've got a good lead. Let's just go ahead and get us some tires as well. That's exactly what the problem is. The Ricky Rudd Quaker State crew going to work on the right side. They are going to make a four-tire change. Let's take a listen as they come around the left side of the car. Changer Lee McCall had a little bit of a problem. We're watching from uh, Davy Allison's Ford Haviland car, and he should be the leader now, unless Harry Gant just passed him a lap ago. So we'll need to check the scoring and see where he stands. Harry did go around the car number 28 just one lap ago. You can see him out in front of him, the green car, Jeff Bodine in the yellow car number five, and evidently the car number five is the leader now. Harry Gant is second, and Davy Allison third. So we're watching here, Davy Allison won in third position. Dale Earnhardt is way up high on the racetrack, as he has been for most of the afternoon. Now side-by-side -side racing here. Dale Earnhardt, a lap down to the field in car number three, and Davy Allison in car number 28, third place. So it's Jeff Bodine leading in car five, then Harry Gant there in the green and white scroll in at number 33 second, and Davy Allison running in third spot with 230 laps gone in the Goodrich 500. Back at Rockingham where a recheck of the scoring has put Rusty Wallace in car number 27 into the lead. Jeff Bodine second followed by Harry Gant, Davey Allison, Mark Martin is in fifth position and then the seven car of Alan Kowicki. Now, this uh, battle here between Jeff Bodine at number five and Harry Gant at 33 is for the second position. Ernie Irvin is down at the bottom of the racetrack in car number two. But there are the two that are contesting the second spot, Bodine and Harry Gant. There is very heavy traffic. Boy, Ernie Irvin and the Kroger Pontiac almost got in the side of Harry Gant entering turn one. And they're going to have a lot of traffic in front of them as they... Progress. That's Richard Petty, car number 43 on the high side, and Lake Speed at number 83 on the low side. Richard had such a good run going a while ago, but now it seems to have gone away on us. Jeff Bodine able to move underneath him going into turn number one. Now here comes Gary Gant also. I think he has a set of tires on this been on the SP Pontiac for quite a while, and they're getting worn, and, and as a result, it slows him down. Again, we're watching second and third position here. Now, we also mentioned a while ago that the number three car of Dale Earnhardt was a lap down. However, again, a recheck with the NASCAR story as Dale Earnhardt in the lead lap and fifth. So we're trying to sort things out here after uh, confusion caused by numerous pit stops and no cautions. But you hit the key there about the pit stops. That, that is what has jumbled the field up and, and you know, one drive behind the lap. We said he went a lap down, then all of a sudden the leaders make pit stops, so that puts him back in the lead lap. So it's very hard to keep up with us here in the booth, but the NASCAR officials, of course, in the scoring stand, do keep up with that. Rusty Wallace, Benton, Missouri, runner-up in the Winston Cup competition last year to Bill Elliott is leading the Good Wrench 500. Let's go down to Jerry Punch. Well, there may be a problem brewing. I should say boiling on Rusty Wallace's car. The car is overheating, we are told. They just called in a radio to engine man, Harold Elliott, and they were going to make a quick pit stop. Well, the problem actually is that rubber off the racetrack has blocked the front grill area. So what they will do, they will bring him in, take this brush in the front of the grill, rub back and forth, and get the rubber away from the grill so you can get air in there to cool the radiator down. So possibly an overheating problem for Rusty Wallace. They may have to make an unscheduled pit stop. Jerry, we wonder if they might not keep him out there long enough since he is in front. They're only about seven laps away from uh, that 
$10,000 bonus from the Gillette people, so I expect they'll keep him out there that long. That's exactly what they decided to do, man. In fact, Barry Dotson has been trying to orchestrate that. He all jumped off the wall a minute ago and got the, the hose ready to squirt the radiator as well as the brush. He says, no, we'll wait about seven or eight more laps, pick up $10,000, and then come in. But Rusty says, I'll keep you appraised of what's happening, but apparently the temperature is getting higher and higher. He may be able to come in now. He may, he may have to come in in the next two to three laps. We'll watch that. Of course, uh, not only has Rusty Wallace already won money for winning the poll, but he stands to pick up another $10,000. And again, we go back to what we talked about in the open end. You won how many thousand for a season? And here he's about to win 10000 for one lap. You know what? Winning the Western Cup Championship in 1965 was worth about $8,000 to me in bonus money at the end of the year. And if a pole sitter wins a Winston Cup race this year, it's also worth money. If, if Rusty Wallace were to win this race today by sitting on the pole, he would $15,200 from the Union 76 people. They're paying $7,600 a race if the pole sitter wins the race. And if he doesn't win the race, it's a carryover. Right. Just like the skins game in golf, it just carries yeah. over to the next hole, and in this case, it carries over to the next race. And we figured it up, and if nobody wins the race from a pole position until the last race, it'll be worth $220,000 to somebody, if they can do it in race number 29. So, boy, there sure is a lot of money in this, <laughs> this game. Or just born 30 years too soon. Jeff Bodine and Harry Gant continue to contest second position as Rusty Wallace continues to lead. There is... Uh, the battle, which really isn't very much of a heated battle right now. Jeff Bodine able to hold on to that second spot. If it was for $10,000, it probably would be a little bit more heated than it is right now. But they're racing for second place, not the lead. Well, now it heats up just a little bit more as Harry Gant takes to the high side of the racetrack and pulls right up on the back bumper of Jeff Bodine. Again, Jet entering some heavy race traffic here. That's uh, Rick Wilson in car number four ahead. Both of them will go to the high side of the racetrack. Just two more laps. If Rusty Wallace comes around this time, he, it'll just be one more lap until he can pick up that $10,000 bonus, according to the scoreboard. We'll watch Harold Kinder, the, the flagman, as he gives the halfway mark uh, scheduled to be the next time. So we're watching Rusty Wallace on his way to winning $10,000 for leading at the halfway point from the Gillette right guard halftime challenge people. Here he is coming into turn number three. Let's watch and see if he hangs on to the lead and picks up the 10 grand. You can see the tires apparently are going away. And yes, indeed, the cross flags are displayed by Harold Kinder. We're at the halfway point, and Rusty Wallace picks up 10 grand. I won that halfway point last year, $10,000. Also, a consumer, Tom Bannerford from Charlotte, North Carolina, told me he won $10,000 as well. Now, let's go down to Jerry. What are they going to do now, Jerry, since he's won that 10 grand? Well, the biggest concern they have right now is to pick it up $10,000. What you see Harold Elliott doing right now, he's trying to get the adapter on the hose here to be able to put water in the radiator. Now, what they had poured in that hose was some of the stuff called cooling system stop leak. It's a, it's a small granular material, and we'll show you when it came out of this small container here. This was open, poured inside the hose. That will be squirted in the radiator, which will help stop any leaks they may have in the radiator. They don't know if they have a leak. They don't know if they have a leak or possibly in the head of the engine. But if it is, it will stop it and therefore help with the cooling of the engine. So we'll watch to see when Rusty Wallace comes in to try to get that car cooled off just a moment. Now, just a second ago, it was Harry Gant in car number 33 that successfully passed Jeff Bodine in car number 5 to take over second position, and here's how it happened. Well, he was down on the inside. They were coming up on Rick Wilson, but Gant, using the low side of the racetrack, just muscled himself down on the inside and took over second place, but now Jeff Bodine trying to move back around as they tried to get around Rick Wilson in the car number 4. Rick Wilson is still right there. Second place, Gant. 33 and third place Bodine car number five. Harry Gant has had a great run. Started in eighth, was 19th at the end of lap 60, then moved up to sixth, and now is in second position at the halfway mark. Taylorsville, North Carolina driver. Here's Rusty Wallace coming in for the stop. Let's go to Jerry Punch. We'll also watch from Jimmy Maycar's crew cam. He's going to get a great shot of Maycar's crew cam as Maycar is trying to scrub the front of the grill section. He's scrubbing this for about six and a half seconds. He is gone. Just cleaning some of it away. 
as he is scurrying down pit road back on the race track. Well, they did not take on tires. I guess they did have a little bit of fuel to it. They did, indeed, but did not take on tires. He was in just 40 laps ago, so I guess Preston said the car is handling okay. Just uh, clean that grill off. And, you know, we saw Norman Pasramicho, the gas man, trying to get that last ounce of gasoline and take a tumble down pit road from the from the crew cam. That was just some sensational pictures from uh, that pit stop that Rusty Wallace made very, very quickly to get the debris out from the grill in the front end of that race car. Just some unbelievable shots. And so the number 33 car of Harry Gant assumes control of the Goodrich 500. North Carolina Motor Speedway in Rockingham. Harry Gant in car number 33 is leading this race trying to win his first Winston Cup race in September of 1985 when he won at North Wilkesboro. And we see Richard Petty coming up behind him trying to get one of his laps back. Has gained on her and yet might be able to get by. I think Richard just made a pit stop a minute ago and he has new tires on the car so he might be able to pull it off. Very again, an exceptionally good run for Harry, Leo, and Andy Petrie. We're hearing that Gant can go about 50 more laps before he has to come in for a stop. Before we went away to commercial, we had uh, a situation in which Rusty Wallace had to come in for a stop to get some debris removed from the radiator, the front end of that car, and the pictures that Jimmy Maycar provided us from our crew camp were just absolutely dynamic. Here they are again. has been the story of the first half of the race. And I don't have a stopwatch, so I don't know right now if Ricky Rudd is running faster than Harry Gant. But uh, Rudd, I think, made a mistake. And just one time he should have changed left, and he didn't. And he's sucking for it right now. He's a half a lap now. Yeah, he's running in eighth position right now. Ned, assessment, Sir, well, Certainly the tire situation uh, going away, and they put on new tires to come back out. Even cars that are running back in the pack, 15 to place put on new tires and they can come back out and, and pass the lead. So the tire situation has been a big factor in this and depending on who came in with, and put on what side tires or four or whatever, that made a big difference in their performance on the racetrack. Strategy has played a big part. And certainly we have seen very few incidents on the racetrack. As a matter of fact, only one, Eddie Beerswell, spinning over in turn number one, didn't hit anything, is continuing in the race and that's been the only caution so far. Now six and seven, are uh, running close together out there on the racetrack. Alan Kowicki in car number seven is now in fourth position and the sixth car of uh, Mark Martin drops back to seven. As a matter of fact, Alan is kind of uh, pulling away from Mark at the moment and we'll update you on the uh, standings at the end of 250 laps. You can see Alan Kowicki running in seventh position, rather in fifth position in car number seven. Very few uh, cars have dropped out of the race at this point. That's something else that uh, certainly has to be talked about in the first half of this event. Yeah, the attrition rate has been very low. Is it perhaps because of the fact that the track was wet when they began, the drivers started this race kind of uh, on pins and needles? Is that why maybe we haven't seen as many crashes as we normally do at Rockingham? I agree. I think that they were probably just a little bit careful to begin with because of the wet racetrack. 
and they got spread out, so they're not close enough to start banging. There we see Ricky Rudd. He has passed the Allen, the Mark Martin automobile, and right in front of him is the Allen Kowicki car. So Ricky Rudd on the move. There's a Sterling Marlin car, and we saw the first car, the black and white car of Allen Kowicki. And that completes the full field rundown for you. There's some information, Benny, regarding uh, lap times on the 26 car and the 33 car. Ricky Rudd right now is out running Harrington about a quarter of a second a lap, so he is gaining on the lead. And, of course, he has newer tires on his car, and that can, can make a big difference. Jack Root uh, can answer a question that we've been wondering about, about uh, tires and Hoosier and Goodyear, Jack. Well, the one team that we've seen down here that's gone from Goodyear's to Hoosier's and back to Goodyear's, of course, was that of Kenny Schrader. I checked with Dennis Connor and asked him as to why, and he said the tactics and what we had seen in practice yesterday was that the Hoosiers, as we had alluded to during one of our earlier reports, were much better for a longer period of time. He said that it wasn't the case when we put them on the car, though. The car got much looser. In fact, when those tires went away, they went away far worse than the Goodyear's. That's why they elected to go back to the Goodyear's. And I think that word filtered all across the pit area, and that's why you're seeing many of the teams that had Hoosiers mounted elected to stay with Goodyear's right across the board. Let's check in with Jerry Punch. Jerry? Down here, the team, the, the teammates, just put on the Kenny Schrader, Rick, uh, Rick Hendrick team, he also has Hoosier and Goodyear's mounted. We might mention the fact that one of the reasons the teams are leery about going to a tire change is that the Hoosiers are about an inch and a half to two inches smaller in circumference than are the Goodyear's. So therefore, if you put the Hoosier tires on, you're going to be seeing more gear, turning more RPM, and possibly punishing that engine even more than you ordinarily would be. They don't want to take any chances in a long race like here at Rockingham. And Jerry, there's a new rule this year as far as the tires are concerned. What you have on when there's 100 miles to go on a super speedway is what you have to finish the race on. You can't change even during a caution period late in the race to a different brand of tire if one brand is faster than another. I think it's 100 miles on the big tracks and 100 laps on the short tracks. And speaking of Hoosier tires, they recorded their second victory in Winston Cup competition here. This is North Carolina again from Taylorsville, North Carolina. In the number 33, Skull Bendit is the leader of the Good Ranch 500. And just within the last 10 or 15 minutes, it appears to be getting darker. We even saw the sunshine, or at least the sun tried to peek through about a half hour or 45 minutes ago. And now it looks like they have rain coming in. Leo Jackson is not lucky enough for it to rain. So <laughs> I drove for him in Pocono, Pennsylvania. We were leading in about, I don't know, three quarters of the race. It had to rain. <laughs> Wrong. It didn't rain. So somebody else got the lead, and then it rained. So, Leo, you ain't got a prayer to rain, I think. The drivers were told in the driver's meeting this morning that there was a window in this weather pattern that would start about 11 o'clock and start drying out and would last till at least 3 or 3.30. And uh, sure enough, about 11 o'clock, the mist stopped falling and it began to start drying the track out and it's been drying out. Of course, we're approaching the so we can get the full race in, but at least uh, NASCAR was correct. side of Ricky Rudd in the number 26 machine. They are contesting the third position. This is the battle for third between 26 Ricky Rudd and 28 Davey Allison. Rudd has the spot at the moment. Boy, man, isn't it a nerve-wracking moment when you drive up along on the outside of someone coming off those corners and there's a retaining wall there? <laughs> Please let them know I'm there. Did it look that close when you were on the racetrack? No, it, it, it looked like you had all kinds of room, but watching from that camera, it looks like it's easy. The number seven car of Alan Kowicki also is uh, involved in this battle for position, so three cars are going for the third position. And there is Kowicki to the outside of Davey Allison, and he takes the position away from Davey. There's the way Davey is... Uh, handling all of this situation rather calmly. Let me tell you something. He may look calm, but in his mind, he's not calm. He's going, hey, these guys right now, they need some more tires. He's screaming to Robert Yates. Robert Yates is probably calm. <laughs> of course, Robert Yates, the crew chief and the car owner of that car number 28, Baby Allison driving. At 
270 laps, and we are now at 294. The average speed of the race was 121.074. The record, 122.129, that was set by Bobby Allison in March of 1984. And an unbelievable on the racetrack out of 42 that began. Are you serious? Yep. Hard to believe. It is. Well, you're right, though. The racetrack is completely filled with cars. It's, there's no room to put any more, I'll tell you. I just had the... Kevin Clark gave me the interval or the time on Harry Kent and Ricky Rudd, who I think these are the two best cars on the racetrack right now. And it is still about a quarter of a second. Ricky Rudd is still gaining on Harry Kent. And he's got a long time do it. He's got over 200 laps to almost 200 laps to run Harry Dean down. Well, there's the shot from the uh, Ford Haviland race game. And now we go inside Rick Mass car the Banquet race game providing the pictures. Rusty Wallace and the Folgers car are just ahead. The Folgers car, of course, driven by Kenny Schrader. Had this shot coming off of the Davy Isaac's car coming off the corner and they spun the camera around. I thought Davy spun out. <laughs> <laughs> Rick's still running very smooth in the Chevrolet of Travis Carter. Yeah, it's a racing team. Travis bought part of that team, didn't you, Dennis, this week? I, I, I didn't ask him about that. Uh, we had a little get together last night over at uh, an Elgin, North Carolina. Travis was there, and I didn't ask him. He told me earlier this week that he had bought a Porsche Cup. Look how calm these guys are, Benny. Now, come on. You're getting all excited up here in the booth, and Rick Mass is just out there for a Sunday drive. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's not quite, quite as tough today as it will be later on when we get into summer. It really gets hot inside of that race car. This is a good day for the race drivers mm -hmm. to run. It's nice and cool and overcast. Uh, but uh, the slipping and sliding you're doing on the racetrack makes it a little bit tough for As a matter of fact, today, looking through those in-car cameras, we've seen in the quarter panel windows some teardrop looking affairs. Those are air vents to get extra car, extra air inside the car to cool the drivers down. Well, once we get to uh, Talladega and some of the other tracks later in the summer, those will be very definitely needed. But right now, it's a rather cool day here in the Sand Hills of North Carolina. A little bit maybe uncomfortable for the fans because they've had to come in their heavy coats, but excellent racing conditions for the drivers themselves. Now, Mastin number 66 sneaking up on to the number 25 of Ken Schrader. All right, let's... Uh, examine the race so far by looking at our Napa race summary. The leader is Harry Gann. He has led 30 of the 280 laps at an average speed of 121.074. 10 leaders, 19 lead changes. Eight cars are now on the lead lap and only two caution periods for 27 laps. And one of those caution periods was at the start of the race because we started on caution because of a wet racetrack. Those that have led the race include Rusty Wallace, Dave Marcus, Larry Pearson, Mark Martin, and Dale Jarrett. Also, Ricky Rudd, Lake Speed, Jeff Bodine, Alan Kowicki, and the current leader, Harry Gann. Out of the race, only two cars, believe it or not. Butch Miller was the first out, uh, car number 51, and then Hunt Strickland dropped out a little bit after that. So Harry Gann is the leader. Looking for his first win since September of 1985 when he won at North Wilkesboro. We'll take another break and be back with more of our live coverage of the Goodwrench 500 at Rockingham. Ned Jarrett, Benny Parsons, Jack Aroot, and Dr. Jerry Punch back at North Carolina Motor Speedway. Well, we may be seeing some pit stops here in the next few laps as the number six car of Mark Martin has come in for a stop. All these people have found out just how valuable having good tires are on their car. Some people have pitted in 40 laps just simply to get more tires on their car so they can run better. You see, they're only taking on right side tires on Mark Martin's car. Phil Parsons was in just a moment ago. Phil has been in the top 10, but it looked like the car was overheating. As a matter of fact, as I speak, he is coming back into the pits. The problem with that, let's go to the pits and Jerry Punch. Well, I'll tell you.
indeed the problem, Ned. That's exactly the diagnosis. The car is overheating. In fact, a number of drivers had complained to their crew chief, Ed the NASCAR, that uh, as they followed Phil on the racetrack, he was losing a lot of water at the overflow in the rear of the car. And it was making their cars very loose as well. So Phil has brought the car back on pit road. Looks like Richard Jackson and the crew will go to work trying to get that car cooled off. You know, we had the situation with Rusty Wallace here a little bit earlier when there was a lot of rubber in the grill of the car. And you can see on front of Phil Parsons' car there, there's not a gr lot of grill there for air to go through. But uh, with the amount of rubber that wear that they're getting here today, there's more rubber being thrown up when you're following other cars pretty close. I remember at Darlington, in fact, the year that I won in 1965, that was a major, major problem that day. Uh, and every once in a while, it happens on a damp, cool day you'll see more rubber that'll stick uh, and be thrown up from the other cars. Plus the fact, as Bob Jenkins mentioned just a moment ago, there's still 40 cars running yep. putting rubber on the racetrack. Yep. Uh, like what what has probably done has broke the cylinder head because as Ned and I watched him leave the pits a moment ago and water just poured out the back of the car and he has to get, be getting compression in the water to do that. So I would say he broke the head. So Phil Parsons goes behind the wall and becomes our third car that has done so. Although Phil may not be out of the race completely, they may be able to uh, fix that car and get it back out. But for the moment, there are now three cars behind the wall. Davey Allison, car 28. Is he coming in for a pit stop? Yes, indeed he is. The Hamilton Ford drops off the banking. And here comes Davey Allison. Shaq Arun is right there. And Raymond Fox Jr. brings the car to the stop, and the first thing that he does is clean off the limited drill area on the Havoline Ford. The Thunderbirds, as you said, have a reduced drill area. They're concerned about overheating. They have elected to change right side tires. They've completed that, and he is off and away. He's the first of our leaders to pit. Darrell Walker just getting the black flag the last time around in car number 17, but they call a 500 winner smoke coming from his car. Kevin Clark handed me a note the last interval he got between the 33 car and Ricky Webb. We had one interval at, at nine seconds, and now it's down to seven seconds. So he's gained two seconds on Harry Gant. We're watching Darrell Walker come off the floor and again, given a black flag, and we can see the smoke coming out of the back of the car. That there is smoke coming from that race car, and so Daryl Waltrip, the winner of the Daytona 500, has a problem, and will be have to will have to come in for a pit stop mandated by NASCAR. So we'll be right back with more from Rockingham and North Carolina Motor Speedway. Continues to lead the Goodwrench 500 here at Rockingham. We've completed 307 laps, so still quite a few to go in this race. But Harry Gant is continuing to hold on to the lead. He's racing there with the number 43 car of Richard Petty. Jerry Punch can uh, explain why Daryl Waltrip came in for a pit stop just a few minutes ago. Quick pit stop on the Waltrip crew and the uh, Waltrip crew members, Sandy Jones, talking to Daryl right now. Sandy, you raise the hood. What was the problem with the car? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna all like somewhere. We're trying to find it. We're tied down a valve cover. We think that's what it was. So they're hoping it was the right side valve cover leaking oil. They came in for about 22 seconds, tightened the valve cover, put the hood back down, and he is back on the racetrack. And there he is, back up to speed. And we have Ricky Rudd making a pit stop as we saw you see Daryl Waltrip smoking rather badly as he is not having good luck here this weekend. Here is Ricky Rudd in for a stop. Larry McReynolds and the crew going to work on the right side. That front tire was discolored for some reason. I don't know what the front, that tire maybe was flat or something, but it was highly discolored. Two tire change for Ricky Rudd, and out he goes in 12.9 seconds. Good pit stop. That, that'll drop him from the third position that he was running in, and let's see, if he comes back out on the track, he's going to be a lap down. Yes, he sure is. There is a leader, Harry Gant. on the lead lap. You can see the number 11 car of Terry Labonte that's running right behind the leader, actually trying to unlap himself. He's running in uh, ninth position, so there are eight cars. Now make it nine as Labonte gets the lap back on the lead lap. Back after this from Rockingham. And still leading the Goodwrench 500, we anticipate pit stops here in just a few moments. However, one car that's already in the pits, not for just routine services, Terrell Walter. 
Well, they are working beneath the hood of the tight Chevrolet and a Darrell Walsh, the Daytona 500 winner, still sitting in the car. And DW, what's the problem? Well, they tell me the oil pan's busted, uh, Jerry. I don't know. Uh, it just started smoking all at once. Uh, we had enough problems without that. I just thought the tires were smoking. It seemed like they ought to be in the way we've been slipping and sliding. But, hey, it's a, it's an odd day, you know. The rain last night made tire wear bad, and uh, then the track's just real damp, and it's, it's not really easy today. Well, they're going to try to work on it and get him out of here. He currently is the, the point leader after the one event at Daytona. And Darrell Waltrip sitting behind the wall here in the Tide Chevrolet. You know, they talk about Harry Gant, that we've gotten word that he's going to stay out until... Here comes Jeff Bodine down pit road, the second place car coming down pit road. Alan Kowicki. Alan Kowicki, the third, third place car coming down pit road. They tell me Harry Gant's going to stay on the racetrack until the fuel pressure drops. We can watch these two cars change, these two cars changing tires. The fuel pressure stays at about seven pounds. When his car starts running out, it will go to down, down to about four or five pounds and not hurt anything. Here there. comes Rusty Wallace, our fourth place car. There we see Rusty coming into the pit. Right behind the Sterling Monster. Back home, if you wonder how to do it, just watch that. That's how to do it. <laughs> Darryl Darryl Walsh, everything he knows. <laughs> <laughs> Darrell Walsh is going back on the racetrack, so maybe he thinks he's got his problem fixed. There's Harry Gant, the leader of the race, and watching again, the fuel pressure gauge. Yep, we've been told that he's going to stay out until that fuel pressure gauge starts to fluctuate. Now there is the 26 car, Ricky Rudd, which is fast closing in on Gant. Now, Ricky is a lap down as a result of the pit stop he made, so certainly he would like to get back in front of him in case the crossing comes out, then he would be back in the lap. And, of course, there is Richard Petty also, and Petty, since he came out of the track from his most recent pit stop, has been able to stay right there with Gant. Yes, he has. He has run with him. In fact, right now, trying to pass him, but he has to move down on the inside for Ricky Rudd to allow him to run on the outside. Now, a nice gesture there by Richard, who could have probably stayed up in the groove and created some problems, but he didn't. Ricky Rudd, this is this is important. He needs to get in front of that 33 car. The green 26 needs to get in front of the green 33. Right now, or right a moment ago, Harry Gant was the only car in the lead lap. They're showing Ricky Rudd is in second place. Now he's back in the lead lap, but almost a lap down. So Harry Gant, of course, has a pit stop coming up very shortly. I think that's the situation. All the teams have pitted except the 33 car. past Harry Gant. Let's go back uh, a few moments ago and watch Alan Kowicki. Watch the top of the screen and the fuel. They're putting fuel in the car. They're putting the gas. They, it, it won't go in the car. Somehow it's it just won't. It's a male female thing. It won't make a connection. They're not getting any gas in the car. So let's go to Jack Arood. What happened, Jack? Well, Bob, that's exactly what happened. The male and the female ends would not match, and more than 20 gallons of gasoline was being just spilled all over Alan Kowicki's pit area. Harry Gant, in the meantime, pits right behind Alan Kowicki, and now Gant comes down. Now, what they're going to do with Harry Gant is they've got a little bit of tape on the front of the grill. They said they were probably going to peel some of that away, or actually now Leo Jackson is determined he's just going to scrape it away because he was beginning to show his temperatures up above 220 on the water temp. They've changed the right side tires. They are now going to go to the left sides as well. Four tires all the way around. As your leader screams down the front straightaway, Harry Kent is still on pit road, and they are still cleaning the grill. 22 seconds have ticked away. They've dropped the jacket. and he is away in 26.5 seconds. A good stop for four tires and fuel. In the lead lap, Jack, uh, Ricky Rudd did go around. He's going to be about a half a lap behind Ricky Rudd. <laughs> so there is the leader now, the number 26 car, driven by Ricky Rudd, goes back into the lead after Harry Gant comes in for a pit stop. And we'll take another break and be back in just a moment. 
five with 328 laps completed out of 492. Ricky Rudd is the leader. Jeff Bodine is second, followed by Harry Gant, Mark Martin, and Alan Kowicki. You know, when I saw that basketball promo at the, at the coming back, it made me think of Dick Vitale. He would be screaming right now, we need a T.O., we need a T.O., and that's what we need, the timeout. Uh, I tell you what, Rusty Wallace almost got KO'd right there because he got very close to uh, the number 20 car of uh, Dave Mater and the uh, Ricky Rudd car. He got squeezed between them, but now look at Wallace. He's moving on that number 27 car. Here is the replay on this as they uh, were in turns three and four. Okay, Wallace trying to move around Ricky Rudd and the car down on the inside. He's going to make it three wide, and there might not be room enough in there. In fact, there wasn't, and Wallace had to back off. Almost got knocked into the wall. It's a good thing he did back off, because you're right. There was not going to be room at all. Ricky Rudd leads the Goodrich 500. Jeff Bodine now is in second position, and Harry Gant is in third. There's Ricky Rudd in the Quaker State Buick. His car is in turn one. Turn number one. Car spinning and taking another Morgan one in the wall. It was right in front of Ricky Rudd, but Rudd got through. Boy, that was close. Rudd just survived a very close call. There's Morgan Shepherds. Car stalled on the inside of the racetrack. Now he gets it going. But our, actually our third caution period, but second for an accident comes out. Rusty Wallace was involved in it as well. The back end of his car is bashed in. He comes on around and takes the yellow flag, but he's going to have some work to do on that car. And Terry Labonte very alertly got the left back. He passed Ricky Rudd. Ricky Rudd had to slow down for the accident. Terry Labonte stood on the gas of the Budweiser Ford and came on around and got back to the lead lap. So Rusty Wallace does have damage on that race car and will be watching Jimmy Maycar assess the situation and possibly try to make repairs. You can see that he's got the hammer ready to uh, make any sheet metal work that has to be done to get the uh, metal out from the actual tire on the racetrack. Of course, he's got to catch car. up to the field right now. He was right in front of Ricky Rudd, and so he has to catch up through the field as we watch the work being done on Morgan Shepard's car, who did spin around. Rudd coming into the pits. Everybody else will be coming in. Let's watch it now as we go into turn one. Morgan starts down in turn one, and the two car of Ernie Irvin was down on the bottom side of the racetrack. Morgan thought he had him cleared, turned too quickly. Okay, and Rusty up on the outside gets hit yeah. by Morgan Shepard, knocked into the wall. He gets hit on the inside, then knocked up into the wall. You can see the green car of Ricky Rudd just barely got through that, and you can see the red and white car of Terry Labonte up there. He accelerated and went on by Ricky Rudd, got the All right, now here comes Rusty in for the stop. Let's watch from the crew cam. because that car does have a ding in it in the right rear. So our caution period because of an incident up in turn number one involving this car, Morgan Shepard, Ernie Irvin, and Rusty Wallace. Back with more live coverage after this. Under caution at North Carolina Motor Speedway in Rockingham. Speed World's live coverage of the Good Wrench 500. First of 20 live Winston Cup races that we'll have here on ESPN this year. There's the uh, damage and the work that's going on in the Raymont car, the 75 machine driven by Morgan Shepard. And here comes Harry Gant. Now, it took him long enough. We were wondering why in the world he wasn't coming in for a pit stop, but now he finally does. He did. Let's go down to Jack Aruba. Well, I'm in the Harry Gant pit, and they are taking on fuel and also taking on the right side tires. Now, this pit stop was extremely important for two particular people. The one directly in front of Harry Gant as Gant continues to exchange tires all the way around. Remember, Alan Kowicki was in about 30 laps before and didn't get any fuel. This caution period allowed them to bring the car back in, and they finally got a full tank load of fuel as Harry pulls off. Another car that found
found that this caution was very necessary and a welcome addition to their repertoire was the car of Davey Allison. Actually, Davey, I talked to Robert Yates just about two laps before the caution came out, and he said, we need a caution bad because we went the wrong way on the chassis adjustment. No sooner had he said that and Benny Parsons had said we needed a T.O., then out came the caution. Also, to update you on Rusty Wallace's situation, he is complaining of some problems with the left front of the automobile. So that's about all of the action that we've had in this respite down here on Pitt Road. But boy, we needed one real bad. The action continues here at Rockingham, although it's been a little slow. We've got a chance to get a breath, but we'll be back with more Green Flag action after a word from our sponsor. For just a moment, and we had another incident. It occurred down in turn number four and involved the number 83 car driven by Lake Speed and also a car down... Uh, car number 40 of Ben Hess, I believe, was involved. Yeah, and the 71 of Dave Marcus. Here's it again. Here it is again. The traffic was very tight as they went into turn three on the restart, and you can see the car number 40, the red and white one that Dave Marcus, the blue car, number 71, is pushing around. No, that's Lake... That's speed, speed yeah. car number 83. But Ben Hess, uh, who ha also has a red and white car, was involved. Yeah, he got up way high on the track and got a little sideways, and everybody else uh, reacted behind him. That's exactly right. It was a chain, uh, just a freeway type chain reaction. Ben Hess got the car a little sideways. People didn't know if he was going to save it or not. They backed off the throttle, and too many people. And I tell you, look at this, look at the sun, guys. You see all this sun around the racetrack? Blue. Hmm. Jenkins, you're not a weatherman either, are you? No, I didn't do too well. I said it was going to rain. It didn't. It's now the sun is brighter than it's been all day. <laughs> it's only 180 degrees though. And folks, just before, during, before this caution came out, during the other caution, Terry Labonte had gone behind pit wall a little bit into Budweiser uh, forward number 11 and lost several laps. And Rusty Wallace has, was in and out the pit during that period of time as well. And Jerry Punch is with his crew chief. Well, Dad, Rusty made three pit stops during that last caution flag, and we had, he had radioed in and said he was having trouble driving the car. Just what is the extent of the damage, Barry? Uh, hopefully it's cosmetic. It's, uh, the car's got some characteristics. It's bent in some places. It's not good for it, but he said in one lap he really couldn't tell. Of course, we had new tires on. We've been so busy, Jerry, I don't even know what happened yet, but uh, it seems to be in pretty good shape. We want to talk to Rusty on the air right now while we're in the caution. Is there any problem with that? Are you going to talk to him? He's probably all calmed down by now. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, Bob Jenkins, go ahead and open the radio up. Let's talk right. to Rusty Wallace on the air. Rusty, this is Bob. You copy? Gotcha. Go ahead. Well, I guess you were a victim of circumstances there, getting involved in that little incident up in one. What happened? How to look from your vantage point? This looks like a two car, a 75 car. Just got together a little bit going down turn one and... 75 spun, and I just tried to go to the top side. Got tagged a little bit, but I don't think it hurt the car at all. Rusty, up to that point, how would you uh, characterize your car? Is it okay? Is it handling well? Do you have a chance of winning this race? Yeah, I got a chance of winning it. I think I can win it. I just got out of sync on those pit stops for the last 200 laps. If we need to, uh, everything should be okay. It's just a matter of getting fresh tires, and we get moved up in this restart. It's just going to take some hard driving to the end. Ricky Red's running good. And so it's a bunch of them, but I think we've got a great chance to go ahead and win this thing. Uh, Rusty, this is Benny Parsons. Ricky Rudd came out of no place to lead this race, didn't he? Well, we knew he was pretty, pretty strong yesterday, Benny, and uh, I expect him to be strong throughout the rest of the race, but we're good, too. Now, we've been real pushy for a long time today. We go from a real pushy race car to a real this race car. Uh, the track is just pretty slick out here today, but... Uh, Hopefully, we're all back in sync now, and it's just going to take me getting up to the front. We're all back in the lead lap, and everything's rosy. All right, Rusty, good luck. Okay, thanks a lot. So Rusty Wallace doesn't think that that incident that he was involved up in turn number one has affected the car in any way. We will have a better handle on that when we go back to green flag conditions in just a moment. We'll be right back after we take another break from Rockingham. Flag and race resumes on lap number 347. Down the back stretch, it is the number three car of Earnhardt leading the 26, but the 26 car of Ricky Rudd is the leader of the race. Yeah, Earnhardt is back in the lead lap now, so he'll certainly try to stay out there and hope for another caution. Earnhardt's got a special jump. 
up on the restart. Got position on Ricky Rudd going down to turn one, and now he's got his job to stay there. But we can see Rudd pulling up on his back bumper. It's not going to be easy to do that. And the five car, Jeff Bodine, is running in second, not too far behind Ricky Rudd. There he is, even coming closer to Rudd now, as Rudd will try to relap the three car, Dale Earnhardt. Here they come down through the tri-oval. Earnhardt still staying on the lead lap and fighting off the challenge of Ricky Rudd. Rudd the leader of the race again, and uh, Jeff Bodine in car number five is second. You can see the sky beginning to clear. It's a much brighter and a much better looking day now than it was uh, a half hour ago. Now there is Mark Martin in car number six and Rusty Wallace in car number 27. And this would be a battle for fourth position. Third place is Alan Kowicki and then fourth is Mark Martin and fifth is Rusty Wallace. And there goes Earnhardt down a lap as Rudd successfully passed him coming off turn two. Hey, what, Ricky Rudd is really strong. Rusty Wallace may be able to run with him. Jeff Bodine may be, able, may be able to because maybe they've adjusted the car, but all day he's proven to be the strongest car here. The car has handled well. He can keep it low on the racetrack when he has new tires on him and is able to accelerate fully off the turns. And Ricky Rudd, one of the smoothest drivers in NASCAR Winston Cup racing, he knows how much pressure he can put to the tires and still keep them from spinning. Ooh, here is a three-way battle for third spot. Mark Martin in car six takes over third. Kowicki in seven is fourth, and Rusty Wallace in 27 is fifth. Oh, they touch! Kawicki did a great job of saving it. He was sideways. Oh, boy, was he sideways. That's exactly what happened a moment ago that caused the accident. Just the fellas got, they got together going in turn one, and I thought we had some de deja vu there. But, uh, <laughs> I tell you, you what, man. Yeah, same thing. Or, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well uh, give your French teacher a call, Benny. And, uh, that ain't what to say, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look at it once again. Rusty may have some damage now on the right front of this car in addition to the right rear. Okay, as they go through the tri-oval on the front straightaway and hit into the turn, Allen uh, started to come down, and Rusty was down there, and they got together. Mm. Allen goes very high, and Rusty moves down on the inside. Yeah, he could have done some damage to the right front of the car, but it doesn't appear to be in the smoke down from it now, so I guess it's okay. We see another green-white car right behind the Allen Kawiki car. Hey, again, he's not in the picture right now, but he's coming as well. Yep. The problem that Rusty Wallace and Harry Gent both have right now is they've got to pass Mark Martin, Jeff Bodine, to get to Ricky Rudd. And that's going to be hard to do because, let's face it, the six-car Mark Martin, he's not a pushover. He's been running good all day. Yeah, and if you can use up a lot of car in, in trying to get by some exactly. of those good cars. And when you get to the leader, then you're in trouble. As critical as the tires are today, you need to run your line and be easy on the tires. When you start passing someone, you have to run unusual lines, and that puts extra pressure on the tires and makes them go away even faster. Now, in just about all Winston Cup races, you can figure that there will be anywhere from 10 to 12 cars able to win the race. There is one guy that is definitely going to be uh, in contention for the race, the number 33 of Harry Gann, as he challenges number 7. With 140 laps to go, although, yeah, Rudd has been strong, I think we still have 10 cars that are easily capable of winning this race. i got to agree with that. Yeah, maybe not that many, but maybe seven. Oh, oh Ricky Wicky is spinning in turn three! Down the banking and onto the apron. So Kowicki with a near miss several laps ago in turn number one, now loses it in turn number three. And the caution flag comes out again. Is he going to get well, lapped? Yeah, well, no, he's going to be able to come on around. He's, uh, yep. He has the car fired and he's coming on around while the leader is coming really into turn three. So Kowicki will stay in the lead lap. Yep, as he passes by us here on the front straightaway, it didn't look like there was too much damage to the right side. Here's where we got it again. Did he and Gant get together as they went in the turn? It was pretty right close, touch, yes. yes. I think but he spins around, keeps it out of the outside wall, down to the inside, out of the way of the traffic coming on. So I don't think that he hurt anything. Now the leaders are all coming into the pits, and let's go to Jerry Punch. Ricky Rudd slides the Quaker State Buick to a halt and will go to work and change the right side tires. Now, apparently, they will possibly just make a four-tire change all the way around on Rudd. This caution, a break for Sterling Marlin, who's finished right behind Ricky Rudd. They were about to bring Marlin in by the black flag. 
you see the jam. Now you see Rusty Wallace is targeting left side tire. Timmy May car the car, changing those tires. And Ricky Rudd down and away. Jam showing Rusty Wallace car likewise down and away. Everyone exiting pit road. Four tires, fresh rubber, full fuel tanks. And they're setting 09, 10. Everyone leaving as routine stops have been completed here under yellow. The six car, Mark Martin, had a terrible pit stop, lost about five or six spots in the exchange, had some trouble with the tires on the left side, and he lost about five or six spots. So there is Rudd back out on the track, falling in behind Jody Ridley in the number nine car. There is Wall uh, Wallace, rather, right behind Rudd, and then Jeff Bodine and Harry Gant. Alan Kowicki in number seven is coming back into the pits for a stop, and there's Jack Aroot. Alan Kowicki shows the paint on the, the left side tires from the altercation. They've gone to the right side to make the exchange. They filled up with fuel, and they're going to go all four tires all the way around for the Xerox car. And they're getting ready. Alan's directing traffic inside the car, trying to tell them what needs to be done. That's one of the, one of the signs of a guy that's the owner and the driver. As you know, Benny Parsons, he does call a lot of the shots as he's off and away. I think that he and Paul Andrews works pretty close in harmony and calling the shots. But you're right. I th Alan Kowicki is the fellow says, I gotta have this and I gotta have that. Paul Andrews does a good job giving Alan Kowicki what he wants. So Kowicki with uh, some paint scuff there on the right side of the car goes back on the racetrack and falls in line for the restart, which we should have in just a few moments. But let's see if there's any on the left side because it was hard to tell. Yeah, yep. there is, and mm -hmm. maybe he and Gant did get together when they yep. went into the turn. I think there's some green paint there on the left rear of the Allen Colwicky car. So, with now 360 laps completed, we'll be back with just a moment at Rockingham. Join us as the field has just taken the green flag on lap number 362 for resumption of racing. And Ricky Rudd is leading Daryl, uh, rather Dale, uh, Rusty Wallace is in second spot. Now Dale Earnhardt is out in front of the field, but again, he's just uh, that far behind as far as the lap is concerned. Yeah, he got out in front of all the others. He made a pit stop, but he beat everybody out and was able to accelerate in front of Rudd. And he is back in the lead lap now. He can stay ahead of Rudd. Rusty Wallace told us on the two-way radio, what, 10 laps ago, we can win this thing. Mm -hmm. Now's our chance to find out. And it looks like he was right, because he has closed up on the rear bumper of Ricky Rudd. Wallace making the challenge on Rudd, going into turn number one. Both cars running the low groove. Rudd protecting the spot, out of turn two and down the back stretch now. Here comes Jeff Bodine in the yellow and white car number five in third position. They're catching Dale Earnhardt. Looks like they are going to be able to put him a lap down once again. If they do, there will be seven cars on the lead lap. Right now, there are eight with Dale Earnhardt on the lead lap technically, but watch Ricky Rudd try to pass Dale, and Dale moves to the inside. Still hangs on. Ooh, oh! some contact out there once again as Rudd had to get on the binders and then Wallace banged him in the uh, rear of the car. Whew. I'm telling you. They're getting on with it. So many times last year, Ricky Rudd was right up there in the thick of things and able to win a race leading and then it all went away from him in the last few laps. He's certainly trying to straighten things out this year. Finish those races. Who will ever forget that race, the last race, the race in Phoenix just last yep. November. Right. When he had about a straightaway lead. Oh, Bo Dine got the car a little bit sideways. Harry Gant almost went by him. Now, here is this incident that occurred a couple of laps ago up in turn number three. Now, watch all three cars get together. Boom. Yeah, Earnhardt slipped up in front of Rudd just a little bit. Rudd had to put the brakes on, and Rusty was right there and tapped him a little. As a matter of fact, there were 10 different races last year that Ricky Rudd dropped out of competition with engine failure, and a lot of those he was leading or running in the top five. Now, Harry Gant challenges Jeff Bodine for third position. Gant is really strong today. I'm very impressed. And look at this. Rusty Wallace now has moved to the top of the racetrack. 
as Ricky Rudd still trying to dispose of Dale Earnhardt. Can I'm telling you, he can win this thing easily. Strong. He can. He's very really strong. But look, Rusty Wallace on the outside. I thought he was going to pull alongside of him. Wow. Field run down to the end of 360 laps. Four of the five cars here are going for the lead, really. Rudd, Wallace, Gant, and Bodine. Oh, another incident. Ricky Rudd is all over the racetrack. He collects Harry Gant into the wall. Harry Gant goes coming up of corner number two. Unbelievable. And so it goes. Here's Wallace racing to the caution. He'll be the leader. It looks like Rudd has his car going. Yeah, he's still coming around. He's going to stay left. So Ricky Rudd has the car going again and is going to stay in the lead lap. Rudd, although last year had his problem with the engine, this year he has a problem, at least in this race, encountering another car. And he's got some... Uh, body work rubbing against the right rear tire. Here comes Rusty Wallace and Dale Earnhardt in for pit stops. Once again, we'll join Jimmy Maycar and the crew cam. Side of the racetrack in the black car. They run in the green car on the outside as they go in. He pulls right down behind Dale Earnhardt. Looks, tries to make a move on the inside and does indeed. And they touch, and that gets Rudd out of shape. And Rusty Wallace goes by on the inside, and Rudd just simply can't get it back together. Gant coming around, hits Rudd in the back, and he spins around. Rusty was sideways for a long time, wasn't he? Look at this. Sure Ricky was. Rudd. Ricky yes, Rudd he was. Yeah. And Rusty Wallace, just so lucky. If he touched him, in, if Rudd had touched him in the right rear, he's going to go head on in the wall. And Harry Gant looks like he probably took as much damage in this mm -hmm. as anyone in this situation because he has some pretty serious damage. There is Rudd in the pits, getting a change of rubber on the left side. And Harry Gant is also in. And Jack Aroot can explain what's going on down there. Well, Bob, it looks as if they're going to have to totally reconstruct the nose of the car. He's already gone down one lap. Harry Gant just sitting in the car somewhat dejectedly as the crew looks over the fiberglass front air dam, which is just just crushed. I mean, you, it, it's still hanging on, but now he cuts the engine off, and it looks as if it may be indeed terminal for Harry Gant. Leo Jackson and the crew, Andy Petrie, they're all taking a look now, trying to get the hood up to take a look at the engine. As we said, the, the air dam is just caved back in, and now they're checking to see if it's done any structural damage to the front end of the machine. It has indeed bent a lot of the front bars back up where the radiator is, so it could possibly be that the radiator has actually been backed up into the fan. But while we check on this, let's check in with Jerry Punch. Jerry? Now, Ricky Rudd is being held here in the pits. Rudd, Rudd came in for four tires. They peeled the sheet metal away. And apparently they are holding Ricky Rudd in the pits now. In the driver's meeting, they made a comment about passing cars and to come in the pit road uh, when the yellow came out. And apparently you would have a one-lap penalty. That's what they are invoking here now on Ricky Rudd. And now he's held one lap, a lap, and Rudd just spins a car away and heads down pit road, so a tough break for Rudd. And Harry Gant's car goes behind the wall while, in fact, he's going into the garage area. So a tough break for Harry Gant, his second disappointment of the weekend. Yesterday, leading the Bush Grand National Race with four laps to go, gets the black flag, has to come in, and loses the race. And now he and the crew are headed back to the garage area. 
and uh, they of course are going to try to repair that car to get it back into the race because as we mentioned at the beginning of the show getting back out there and building up Winston Cup points so very very essential Bill Elliott won the Winston Cup from Rusty Wallace last year by a mere 24 points and boy even this early in the year 24 points can be very very valuable 373 laps completed we'll be right back Back at Rockingham, where we are still under caution because of a crash in the backstretch involving Ricky Rudd and Harry Gant. Rusty, this is uh, Bob Jenkins again. For the second time in the race, a very close call for you. How did you see that incident? I was just concentrating on doing what I do. And uh, I'll tell you what, it's just the three car and the 26 car, they both just kind of ran out of racing room down there. I don't really think it was anybody's fault. This got close. We're taking a look at it on replay. It looks like that uh, Rudd got to the inside of uh, Dale and then went back up as the two touched. And Rudd was way sideways, and then you sneaked by. It also looked like that you may have run over some debris. Is that a uh, fair assessment? Uh, I don't think so, Bob. We changed tires anyway since that caution place. We did run over something and wouldn't hurt the tires. But, uh, you know, it's just like going, taking three quarters, three cars down into a pie-shaped corner. When you get to the end of that play, it gets narrow, and that's what happens. You're going to be racing in one more lap quickly. Uh, the other incident, did that affect the handling of the car? Are you okay? Yeah, we're fine. It's going to beat up a little bit. We're all right. All right. Uh, best of luck the rest of the way. Let's go to uh, the garage area where Jack Aroot is uh, with the Harry Gant crew that's trying to repair that car. Well, our initial diagnosis was correct, Bob Jenkins. You can see the radiator that they have just pulled out of Harry Gant's car. We'll get a word with Harry. Now, Harry, points so valuable, you're going back out in the race after exchanging radiators. Yeah, we're, we're going back out and change the radiator and stuff, uh, you know, after, you know, Earnhardt crashed Ricky, and he comes sailing off into me, so nothing I could do, but I slammed the brakes on, but I nothing I could do but hit him. Well, he hit him, but let's check in with Jerry Punch quickly before the green flag. Well, you're looking at the brain trust of the Ricky Rudd team, Lou LaRosa and Larry McReynolds, the engine builder and crew chief, respectively. They are concerned about Rudd, and the reason they held Rudd the lap, as we explained it before, the way it was explained to them, if you move up under caution, you pass cars in front of you, in order to get into the pits quicker and make a quick pit stop, they will hold you a lap, and apparently that was explained in the driver's meeting. It's being invoked here today for the first time, apparently, and Rudd got caught. It indeed was explained in the driver's meeting, Jerry. I heard Dick Bate, the competition director, say that. The green flag waves again. The green fly comes out on lap number 377. So we've got uh, 125 laps to go. And look at Rusty Wallace just blow by Mark Martin coming off the second corner. Jeff Bodine trying to go follow him could not get by. Danny, Mark Martin only took on gas during that pit stop, and that might have been a mistake. The others changed tires, and as we've documented already today, boy, those new tires make a great deal of difference. Well, it looks like it was a mistake. Mark Martin. And Dale Jarrett spot. spinning down in turn, Queens turn one and two. See if any other cars are going to be involved. Dale Jarrett spins down the banking and into the entrance to the backstretch pits, and there were other cars involved, but no hardy to be left back. And Dale Earnhardt did beat Alan Kowicki back to the check or the uh, caution flag, and so Dale finally gets his lap back. He sure did. He, he had, the crew had gotten him back out in front of the, the leaders several times, and this time the caution came out earlier enough for him that he was out in front of him and gets back in the lead lap. Well, there's several other cars came together over there in turn number two, but nobody else uh, spun, so Dale Jarrett apparently the only one that uh, did slide down the banking over there in turn number two. Now Mark Martin is going to decide to come in and get some tires. Yep. He said, I didn't like that at all. As Dale Earnhardt encircles the entire racetrack and becomes the sixth car that's now on the lead lap. And the number six car of Mark Martin is in. They'll make a tire change. I don't think Dale Jarrett hit anything. He just made a 360. He's back out on the racetrack and coming around. We, uh, we of course, were following the leaders because we were just back under green. 
uh, just for a few laps. We caught the tail end of it, and you see the smoke as Jarrett spins around, makes a 360, almost goes back up on the racetrack, then is able to pull it back down on the inside of the track, and he didn't lose a lap in that incident. A lot of cars behind him, though, really had to brace, and uh, there could have been serious trouble there, but everybody was heads up, and apparently nothing too serious. So Mark Martin goes back out onto the racetrack after a tire change in the Strolite Ford. Field behind the pace car with 390 laps completed. And we have some uh, shots from Rick Mass in car camera as he saw the incident ahead of him. Well, maybe he saw it, maybe he didn't, because it went completely, it went dark in front of him, all of that smoke. And there you see Jared's car down on the left side of his windshield, and then the smoke clears, and Rick said, oh boy, I got through that, and didn't hit anything, because for a moment, he had no idea what was in front of him. You know, only an experienced race car driver would get through that, because when you drive into that smoke and literally cannot see a thing, all you can do is just simply keep going forward yep. and not spin the car uh, because as long as you're going forward, one of these days you're going around out of smoke and then you can start driving the car again. But when you spin, you have no control whatsoever and you're at the mercy of the other people. Unless you hit something before you clear the smoke. That's right. Here's another angle from uh, our camera inside of turn number three. Now we can see all the cars trying to take the evasive action because they really didn't know if Dale was going to go back up and hit the outside retaining wall. I saw Rick Mask come in a moment ago, and someone did poke him in the back because he had some damage in the left rear of that car. So we are nearing 100 laps to go in this Goodrich 500 from North Carolina Motor Speedway. We'll take another break and be right back. Back at Rockingham, where green flag conditions are now on the racetrack, and Rusty Wallace is breathing down the neck of Alan Kowicki. Kowicki at number seven is the leader. What's not anymore? Rusty Wallace passes Alan. He may have, uh, what, got a little sideways or what? I think he stepped a little bit, and Alan has not stopped during these last two cautions, although they didn't run near very many green flag laps either time, but he didn't stop, and Rusty Wallace does have on pressure tires and just motored around him. You know, as close as the cars are running anymore, track position means so much. And Alan just felt like the track position was more beneficial to him than the four tires. And we'll see if that's true or not. Meanwhile, the number five car of Jeff Bodine now moves in on the rear bumper of the seven car of Alan Kowicki. And so we may have a battle for second shaping up here. It's Rusty Wallace, then Alan Kowicki, and Jeff Bodine. The other cars on the lead lap include Davey Allison, Dale Earnhardt, and Mark Martin. Let's go down to Jerry Punch. You think these guys don't have some fun here in the afternoon in stock car racing? Well, let me tell you this, what happened a minute ago. Kenny Schrader came down pit road stopped his car here and Rusty Wallace pit started pounding his steering wheel. Immediately Wallace's crew runs over thinking Schrader may have a problem. Schrader's laughing. He reaches out and hands him a hot dog, laughs, cranks the car up and goes on down pit road. They're having some fun here at Rockingham. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever heard about that happening in a Winston Cup race. I wrecked in Darlington last year in the spring race and we fixed the car and I was back on the racetrack and the caution came out and I asked Harry Hyde, do you want to make a pit stop. He said, we're eating ice cream right now. As soon as we finish the ice cream, we'll be able to make the pit stop. <laughs> While the uh, 28 car of Davey Allison and the 6 car of Mark Martin exchanging positions here off of corner number 4, the 6 car of Martin to the inside of Davey Allison. And of course, that's for the 5th position. First and second here with Wallace leading. And then second place, Alan Kowicki and Jeff Bodine. Kowicki's hanging in there pretty good with those used tires, Ned. Yes, he is. Uh, also, as I mentioned, you know, they perhaps didn't have over eight or ten laps of green flag running because those cautions came out so quickly after the green flag was displayed. But still, every little bit makes a difference. But now maybe he did made that little slip and said, hey, I'm going to back under control here and try to stay with these guys. Right behind the five car. Well, he didn't quite come in the picture that time. But we'll, we're going to see a green car in just a moment. There he comes. 26. Ricky Rudd. The car's bent up. But it's always a little smoke. But yep. He's still getting around the racetrack very well. He'll be up in the second trying to get his lap back. And that's going to be interesting. Yeah, he's got to be uh, a little bit mad. Right now. Uh -huh. and, uh, Maybe has something.
something to prove, huh? A little revenge here? <laughs> it looks like he's coming pretty good. Wallace, though, stretches out the advantage on Kawicki and Jeff Bodine. Although not very much. And some uh, smoke coming off the number five car also. Quickest cars on the racetrack right now, but uh, unfortunately he is a lap down because of the NASCAR penalty. And Rusty Wallace, what does he have to prove? He's leading the race. You know, he doesn't have to prove by anything by running away from it. Last year we saw Rusty on several occasions come from a lap or more down to win a race. And I don't think he's ever been out of the lead lap today, but he has survived two very close calls as far as incidents on the track are concerned. Yeah, I think there was a time, uh, or maybe even twice, one time that I remember that he made a pit stop under green and went a lap down, but he got back in the lead lap. Mm -hmm. Anyway, a great afternoon for Rusty so far. And good runs by Alan Kowicki and the number five car of Jeff Bodine. Now we're within the 100 laps, which means uh, we're into the tire rule that you talked about earlier, Ned. Yes, they cannot change brands of tires from this point on. They have to finish on whatever brand of tires they have right now. However, we haven't seen that much switching around here this afternoon of the Kenny Freighter. He started on Goodyear, switched to Hoosier, then went back to Goodyear. So I don't think that uh, would be a factor anyway, but we'll mention it because it certainly will be a factor sometime during this year. Here comes Rudd closing in on Jeff Bodine. Rudd has his work cut out for him to get that lap back. There's the first three cars. The white car in front, 27, Rusty Wallace, in the red and white of Alan Kowicki, the yellow and white of Jeff Bodine, and the solid green of Ricky Rudd. 22 laps ago, Rusty was 2.04 seconds ahead of Ricky Rudd. Right now, he is 1.59 seconds, so Ricky Rudd is gaining on Rusty Wallace. And he's not running off and leaving the seven car and the five car, Alan Kowicki and Jeff Bodine. They're maintaining right now. Yes. Of course, he has to dispose of them before he can get to Rusty. That's true. We've got 95 laps to go. You can see the damage on the red car on the right rear after his incident with Dale Earnhardt and then with Harry Gann. The look at Rudd Gann. You know, when they run about 10 laps, his car just takes over. He's on the still on the bottom of the race track, and none of the competition is. They drift up, and Rudd stays right on the bottom. Look at him close on Bodine underneath him. See if, take the position. see if he passes here on the front oval. Nope, not this time. Well, he's cut it down to 1.18 hundredths of a second, so he is definitely gaining on Rusty Wallace. At the end of 400 laps, here's the field summary once again with Wallace and Kowicki and Bodine running first, second, and third. Now here's Rudd working to the inside of Bodine once again. But Jeff holding him off. Well, of course, uh, Jeff realizes that it is to his advantage to try to keep his run back there, uh, a lap down, because he knows that's just another person that he'll have to contend with as they get down near the end of the race. If Red's able to get back in the lead lap, well, he knows that uh, he has a strong car, and he's finding that out right now. He's alongside Bodine. He has position this time. I think he's going to take the spot. Bodine goes high. Rudd tries to hold it on the bottom, but he can't. Jeff with just a little bit more momentum in the corners up on that high groove. Now Rudd decides to fall in behind him. We're watching Ricky Rudd in the green number 26 Quaker State car try to pass Jeff Bodine and try to get his lap back. But for the moment, he is unable to do so. Leading the race is Rusty Wallace, second Alan Kowicki, and third is Jeff Bodine. The computer says, Bob Jenkins, Mark Martin is the only car that can complete the race on the fuel that he has in the car. The only car. The rest of them has to stop. Mark Martin doesn't have to stop. Maybe we're going to look at another Daytona all over again. The fellow who has the most fuel wins the race. If we go the rest of the way without a caution period. So there is uh, Jessica Waltrip watching the activity. Her dad has not had a good run here this afternoon. We'll be right back. North Carolina Motor Speedway in Rockingham for the Goodrich 500. Rusty Wallace, Alan Kowicki, Jeff Bodine, first, second, and third. And we're still watching the number 26 car of Rick.
tricky rut trying to get the lap back and so far he just hasn't been able to do so. We are at lap 406. Less than 100 laps to go and this race will be over. Well, let's talk a little bit, guys, about Daytona and the fact that the Chevrolets were so strong there, the Rick Henry cars. Oh, here comes Harry Gant back out on the racetrack. And there again, we see the... Uh, the reason why he comes back out is to get those points. The Chevys uh, have not been as impressive here this afternoon as they were at Daytona, the three Henry cars, and then uh, Rick Mass were so strong there. But today we're seeing the Pontiacs and the Fords and the Oldsmobiles and uh, all cars very competitive. I think that Daytona, that the, the Chevrolets, the fellas, have been running that car for three years in Daytona. So they knew what to expect. They knew how to adjust the car. They knew a lot about it. The fellas with the new Ford... Thunderbird Super Coupe, and also the Pontiacs. NASCAR made them change the rear of those cars just a little bit before they went to Daytona. And I think that that hurt those cars. And the Chevrolet just knew more about their cars than the rest. What a race we got going. I mean, we got three, the first three right in the almost nose to tail, and Ricky Rudd, who may be faster than all three, a lap down behind trying to get his lap. And Brett Bedine, who was running in the seventh position, is in the pits with the hood up on the Motorcraft Ford. So Brett Bedine had a good run going here today, but it uh, looked like it's going up in smoke right now. It yeah, is. a considerable amount of smoke coming from that car on pit road as we watch the action on the racetrack. That's Jimmy Means in car number 52 there. Uh, his new Alka-Seltzer sponsor showing on that car as the others pass on the high side. I've been told that NASCAR has brought the 53 car driven by Jerry O'Neill in to the pits for a physical check. Hmm. They say it's weaving on the racetrack, and he is a super modified driver who's accustomed to running 50 and 75 and 100 lap features, not accustomed to this kind of mileage. They feel like he may be physically worn out. They want to check him out. Well, run once again, pulling alongside of Jeff Bodine, but no go as Jeff retains that spot. These guys are racing hard, though, and while they're racing, Rusty Wallace is not pulling away at all. No, he isn't. So, a lot of cars that are very equally matched. Here, the five-car Bodine on the outside of the seven. Is he going to? No, he doesn't have enough room to get on the outside. I thought for a moment he was going to get outside of Alan Kowicki. He's Let's going to try it again. Working the high side, Jeff Bodine. Nope, not this time. Let's go for a report from Jerry Punch very quickly. Well, Ricky Rudd led all other competitors last year in one category. That was engine failure, the category you don't want to lead. He had 10 engine failures, the majority of those coming when he was leading the race. Well, they had a problem, a missing link, or as Kenny Bernstein would call it, a missing Lou. He rectified that problem by hiring Lou LaRosso, who's behind me as the engine builder. You see what happens today. This car is one of the fastest on the racetrack. He is now making a move inside Bodine, trying to get his lap back. Rudd still has a shot at winning it because of this man here, Lou LaRosso, dynamic engine builder. Lou LaRosa on the right side of your screen there as he's watching his driver Ricky Rudd. Lou, of course, formerly with the Dale Earnhardt crew. We mentioned that Brett Bodine had, was in the pits. He now has taken his car to the garage. He was running in seventh place. Now that will move Sterling Marlin up to seventh place in the Sunoco Oldsmobile. Sterling here without the crew chief services of Jake Elder, who had been with them for a little over a year. Jake was named the uh, suitcase Jake a number of years ago because he moved around to so many different teams. So he's got his suitcase back again. He'll land somewhere pretty shortly because the guy has a lot of talent. In fact, he worked for you one time, didn't he? Three years, yeah. He was... Uh, I probably had more success with J.C. as the crew chief than anyone else. Rudd is really trying hard to get that lap back, and all that racing that he's been doing uh, is not paying off very much. Meanwhile, what's the situation in the Rusty Wallace pit? Well, let's go to Jack Aroo to find out. Well, Bob, you were surmising whether this team could go without another pit stop. If it stays in green, what about it, Barry Dodson? Do you have to make another stop, or can you go the distance? stop as you surmise now don't forget that could bring mark martin back into the hunt indeed we may have another another daytona situation where fuel is going to become the critical factor and those that are playing it conservative and saving fuel right now may come out on top including mark martin Be interesting to see 
So it is Rusty Wallace still leading with Kowicki second, Jeff Bodine in third, running in fourth position is Dale Earnhardt, and fifth is Mark Martin. 417 laps completed. Bob Jenkins, Ned Jarrett, Benny Parsons, Jack Arood, and Dr. Jerry Punch back at North, Wil rather at uh, Rockingham. We'll be at North Wilkesboro in a few weeks. Rockingham, North Carolina, the site of our Winston Cup race this afternoon. And it remains much the same on the racetrack as Wallace continues to lead. Then uh, Alan Kowicki and Jeff Bodine in the green car number 26 of Ricky Rudd, a lap down. Now that black car there falling in behind Ricky Rudd is the driver that we talked about a few minutes ago, O'Neill, who was brought in by uh, NASCAR to be checked physically, but apparently they're satisfied and he's back out there on the racetrack. That time, Alan Kowicki ran the high groove through one and two. I've been wanting him to try that for the last three or four laps. He's been going low, 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 and I felt like that maybe he could move up high down in one and two and run the same line that Rusty Wallace was running. Their 71, Dave Martin's coming back in trying to get some more of those valuable Winston Cup points. Not much of a front end on that car, but nevertheless, Dave Marcus goes back in competition. Now we have Alan Kowicki making a bid for the lead here on Rusty Wallace as he got real close to Rusty coming out of corner number two and a real great three-car battle for the lead here. Here's Alan Kowicki moving inside of Rusty Wallace in turn number four. Let's see if Alan... Yeah, he can. He can just power by Rusty Wallace, and so Alan Kowicki led that lap, but here comes Rusty Wallace battling back, and Jeff Bodine is also right there. I don't, th I don't think Alan can make a stick on the bottom of the racetrack, and it, they might have made some contact, but he might be able to make a stick on the bottom down in three and four. Might be able to. He's been getting through this corner extremely well. Let's see. Tight, tight racing. Oh, Rudd smoked the tires coming off the corner. Oh, here it is. He blew up. The engine blew out of Rudd's car. Yep. And so, what plagued Rusty and rather Ricky Rudd many times last year may have also eliminated him from this competition as he drops to the bottom of the racetrack. Meanwhile, we continue to see Rusty and Allen and Jeff Bodine go at it tooth and nail out there. Here comes Richard Petty at number 43. Now, he made a pit stop about 10 or 12 laps ago, has new tires on his SPP Pontiac, and he's just been flipping off one car and then another and has run the leaders down. He's been supposed to have been out front all day long, and Richard Petty's run him down about to pass him. Here comes Rudd into the pits. Let's get down to Jack Aroot. As they bring the car down on the pit road, the Quaker State team is ready to go to work on right side tires. According to the report from Ricky, but now there's they've got something underneath the car that is on fire. It looks as if he's cut a brake line and he can't stop the car. And it looks as if the brake line is what is actually caught on fire and he's overshot his pits. They said they thought he had a right side tire, but now he's got to go all the way down to the end of pit road. They're still trying to stop the car. And he's all the way down to turn one, Bob. And he's going around again. As he was coming down pit road, if we can go back to replay, some, some debris flew out of the back of that car. Something broke off the back of that car as he was coming down pit road. But meanwhile, look at Richard. He's past the three leaders of this race. He can still drive a race car. Oh, yeah, no question, man. And here is the three leaders. Left. He's down five laps. And I guess now would only be down four laps after uh, getting back the debris. Yeah, that's, that's the That's a great rotor. A brake rotor exploded as Rudd was coming down pit road. And now, Kowicki once again bidding for the lead on Rusty Wallace through the tri-oval. Side by side. Into turn number one. They've got a slow car ahead of him. That's J.D. McDuffie in turn number 70. See, Alan Kowicki said, wait a minute. Let me get behind Rusty Wallace. Because if I go in there and get hung in behind J.D. McDuffie, the five-car Jeff Bodine's going to get by me. Wait a minute, folks. Good move on Alan Kowicki to pull in behind and, and keep from get, using that 70 car, letting Bodine use a 70 as a pick. So first, second, and third, nose to tail on the racetrack. Meanwhile, Rudd is in the pits again and still trying to get the car stopped. Look at him weaving, trying to get the car stopped. The pit crew comes out and tries to slow the car down, and yeah, they finally get it stopped. I believe they got it. Whew. Yeah, that's a tough break. Let's go back and take a look at what happened when Rest when uh, Ricky was coming into the pits. Benny, this is the incident you mentioned. Yeah, let's see a brake rotor just explode on the car. And that's what caused that extra smoke that we saw just yes. as it came into the pits. Kowicki still working on Rusty Wallace. Rusty holding him off. 
against Pontiac, against Ford, against Chevy. The number 40 car. Oh, uh, Ben Hess. tried to use Ben Hess as a pick. Now he's going to go on the inside. But they tell me Butch Miller's driving that 40 car now. Did someone tell me that just a moment ago? We heard that never confirmed. It could be, though. Now three abreast racing here at turn one. Look, that was close. Jeff trying to get the low side advantage. Meanwhile, here's Kowicki still looking to the inside as they go to the high side of the racetrack and pass Mickey Gibbs in car number 48. Mickey had been up in the top 15 for a while, but he has slowed in the last 15 or 20 laps. Caution is on the racetrack. Debris, Debris on Debris the racetrack. Debris. Yep. Well, all that strategy of uh, going the rest of the way goes out the window exactly. here now because everybody will be able to come in and get tires and gas and, and don't have to worry about it. Mark Martin and I probably didn't want to see this caution. And instead of a race that could be determined by fuel mileage, it looks like it will be a race determined by horsepower and intestinal fortitude. Let's go down to uh, Jack Aroot, who's in the rut pit. Well, Ricky Rudd has dropped the, the window net, and he's turning the radio off as the leaders come down on the pit road for their service. It's a dejected, it's an absolutely dejected Ricky Rudd crew. The brake rotor has been exploded. As we watch the Rusty Wallace crew cam go to work here as they work on our leader, Rusty Wallace, you get the work that he's going on right side tires there. As Jimmy Makar completes his work, comes around the front of the car, it starts to go to work on the left side. They've already taken the lug nuts off, so Maker just has to pop the wheel up, put the new lugs on, he's done, and pushes the car off, and that's the, the stop from the crew cam by Rusty Wallace. In the meantime, Ricky Rudd has gotten out of his car, and Alan Kowicki goes by. So we're gonna try and get a word here with, with, with Ricky here as he takes his helmet off. This is a tough night. He gets a, gets a whisper from his wife, Linda. As we were saying, the entire as you can see, has just exploded. Dale Earnhardt, by the way, has picked up two positions on the pit stop exchange, and that's some good work. And let's update you that all the front runners had said they were going to have to come in at least for a splash and go. Let's go back upstairs. All right, Ricky Rudd climbs out of the car as the crew assesses the problem in the left front of the car. A brake rotor lets go and eliminates Ricky Rudd's chances of winning this good wrench 500. Several other cars are coming in now, some for an original pit stop and others to get a change of left side rubber. And that's an unusual situation to have a brake rotor just explode the way that did. It sure is. I, evidently, when he made contact over there, he warped the thing, he bent the thing a little bit, and he had some run out in it, and the thing was balanced, was out of balance. Otherwise, uh, I don't see, I just can't see anything exploding. Like so we're nearing the close of the Good Ridge 500 with pit stops being completed. We'll go back to green in just a moment. Four laps completed. Rusty Wallace leading. Dale Earnhardt now is second. Jeff Bodine third. Alan Kowicki fourth. And Mark Martin is fifth. And the other car on the lead lap in sixth position is the number 28 car driven by Davey Allison. The green flag has come back on lap number 436. And we are back to racing. Well, Dale Earnhardt, we haven't really talked about much this afternoon because he has had his problems. But now he finds himself in second position. Some good hit work has helped him to get up there. Of course, he has driven the car very well this afternoon. Good Wrench uh, sponsored this race as well as his car. They have a lot of people here watching him. Naturally, they want to see him get up there and fight for the lead. But he's battled all afternoon and maybe in shape to get up there and challenge the rest of all the time. Jeff Bodine hangs there in third in the yellow and white car number five. Then comes Alex Kowicki, car number seven. So the leaders, once again, very close together on the racetrack. As Earnhardt now appears to be closing in on Rusty. I think that the race is just enough distance that any of those four cars can win. It's just whose car handles the best after about 10 or 15 laps. That's what's going to tell the story. If they have a cost flag every 10 laps, Rusty Wallace will win the race, or Earnhardt. Because Rusty's car really takes off when it has brand new tires on it. And as we saw before the caution came out, they were up there battling with him for the lead. Dale Earnhardt has not led a lap this afternoon in second, and there is Jeff Bodine in third position. Alan Kowicki went in that time and changed four tires, but now he is falling back. He's not able to run like he did just a moment ago on used tires. I don't know. Uh, you see the car wiggle? 
quite dramatically off the corner. I don't know if the stag is off or it just takes a few laps for his tires to come in. Maybe that's a possibility. Could be. Might have a little bit of push in the car. And normally with new tires, if you got a little push in there, it uh, shows up more then than if you run on a little bit. The car loosens up and, and it really starts working to your advantage. Briefly recapping what has happened today as we are nearing now the closing stages of this race. And by the way, right after our live coverage here, we'll be going to Miami, Florida for the IMSA Miami Grand Prix. The race started under caution. The first 20-some laps were run under caution while the track dried out. We went green and uh, have only had very few caution periods since then and for no major accidents whatsoever. Ricky Rudd has looked strong throughout the day, so of course is Rusty Wallace. And uh, Harry Gant looked very good for a while, but Gant and Rudd were both involved in an incident on the backstretch that eliminated uh, both of them from a chance of winning. So right now it is Rusty Wallace in the lead with Earnhardt second and then Jeff Bodine and Alan Kowicki. 50 laps to go, 50 more to go. Martin, Martin. Still, anything can happen. I'm sorry, Bob. Martin Martin is the fifth place car, and he had some speed early on, but right now he just doesn't seem to have the speed that he had earlier. Give you a field summary here and uh, give as many cars on the racetrack as possible. There, of course, is Rusty Wallace, who is leading. And the Kodiak Pontiac. Behind him, Dale Earnhardt in car number three, the GM Goodrich Chevrolet. Then comes Jeff Bodine. Car number five, the Levi Garrett Chevrolet running in third spot. Behind him is Alan Kowicki in the Zero X Ford, car number seven. And he is in fourth position. And now behind him comes a group of cars, including Mark Martin in car number six. Uh, Sterling Marlin in number 94 to the inside. And then Jody Ridley, who took over from Bill Elliott early in the event. There's Jim Sauter in car number 31, and he's had a fine race, Ned. He certainly has. He's running in eighth position. That car owned by Bob Clark, the Slender U people from Crossdale, Tennessee. Jim from the state of Wisconsin has driven a very good race here. They're looking for sponsorship for that car, so it's Rick Mask and a couple of others in the field and say if we can uh, get that, we think that we got a team here that can run a run. I'll tell you, I visited their shops about six weeks ago in Crossville, Tennessee, and was very impressed with the type of facilities they have over there. They got some facilities for a first-class team. You saw Davey Allison briefly there running in sixth position. There is Dale Jared in car number 29, who was 11. Three laps down. Terry Labonte, you also got a shot of. He's in car number 11. However, he is well down in the field because of a very long period behind the wall. Now, we see Alan Kowicki has closed in on Jeff Bodine in the battle for third position. So, Kowicki, although he dropped back there just after the pit stop, has now found some speed. It looked like Ned was exactly right, that on the new tires, the car was just a little bit too tight or pushed a little bit too much. A few laps on the tires, they've evened out, and now he is about as good as anybody out there. He has caught Jeff Bodine. And, uh, of course, as you said earlier, Benny, catching him is one thing and passing him is another. <laughs> and, and he's got some tough customers ahead of him. The unfortunate thing about it is that everyone runs in the same place. You notice that? Mm -hmm. The five car goes in the, in the corner, the seven car falls almost in the same tracks. Now, you can be faster, but if you have to run in the same tracks as the car in front of you, how are you ever going to get time? It's, it becomes very difficult. There's always one place on the racetrack that is faster than anywhere else for each car, depending on how they are set up. But usually, cars that are pretty easy to match, that one spot is usually the same spot. That's correct. Bodine is going a little bit higher up in turns one and two than the seven car of Kowicki, and we see Allen get it through three and four extremely well. He's alongside Jeff, going down in turn one. What do you think, Bob? What do you think? No. Say something. He's got yeah. it, ain't he? Yeah, he's got it. Of course, now getting on, traction Jeff. off the of turn two is pretty tough. But he, if he keeps that position, which it looks like he will going into turn three, I think he'll get it going into this turn or as they come out of fourth. Well, they're equally matched. That's they, are, they are that. <laughs> they are that. And, you know, we should mention also Allen's uh, performance at Daytona. He darn near won the thing. In fact, he said the fuel was not a problem with him, but uh, it was a tire situation that cost him the race. Look at this. 
Now I think he's got him. Nope. That goes to Burdine, back on the outside. No, no, no. Burdine, one thing he does have is a lot of horsepower under the hood of that car. Because he was on the outside, as Danny said, he had the momentum as he came off the turn. Now here comes Kowicki down on the inside. Now he can get better traction coming off the turn four. Yes. And turn two. As a result, it takes uh, over the position. He has him. Yep. So Alan Kowicki now moves into third position. Oh, and look at Bodine. He's way up high in the marbles, as a matter of fact. He went very high. He was trying to keep up with Kowicki. And you know, the thing is, when, when somebody starts a little bit better than yours, and you try to go in the corner and follow them, you get in too hard. And that's what happened to Jeff Bodine. So we've been watching third and fourth. Now here is first and second as Rusty Wallace leads Dale Earnhardt in the closing stages of the Goodrich 500, 452 of 492 completed. All right, we got 458 laps completed, and it's time to go around the room here and decide who's going to win this race. And I've been told that I must predict first since uh, I sometimes try to weasel out of this prediction business because I'm no good at it. I'm going to say that Rusty Wallace will hang on to win this race. Benny? Well, my heart wants me to vote for Alan Kowicki, but my brain tells me he can't get by Dale Earnhardt. But I'm going to go with my heart. Alan Kowicki. If this race goes green the rest of the way, I think Alan Kowicki will do it. If it, if there's a caution between now and the end of the race, then I think it'll be Rusty Wallace. All Is right. that hedging well enough? <laughs> <laughs> Jack, what do you think? Well, I've been watching how quietly the Goodrich people have gone about their business all day, and I'm going to pick Dale Earnhardt. They said that they've gone back and forth between trying to get the car tighter and loosening it up. Right now, they feel they've got the right setup, and I think they might make an assault on the front row. All right, and finally, our other pit reporter, Dr. Jerry Punch. What do you think, sir? Well, as we said at the top of the show, I think that Rusty Wallace had this race car. It's his favorite car named Whitney after Whitney Houston. He won four of the six events in this car last year. The car is almost uh, unbeatable here back in, uh, back in the fall. It has to make it up two laps. I believe Rusty will hang on and win it. Okay, so... Jerry and I are in agreement that Rusty will win, and Benny and Ned think Allen will, and Jack says Earnhardt. So here's the top of 30 at the end of 450 laps. As we watch first and second place, Rusty Wallace and Dale Earnhardt. And there's Kowicki, not too far behind, guys. He's not too far, just about a second or so. He's gaining a car length or two. I don't know. Yeah, he's gaining a little bit on him. Gained a little bit on him. He was over two seconds behind him not too long ago, and now he's cut it down to about 1.3. It looks like that the, the three car all of a sudden just can't quite keep up to me. You guys that voted for Earnhardt, Jack <laughs> looks like he can't quite keep up right now. Well, race isn't over yet, so uh, let's... <laughs> But without question, Alan Kowicki is moving in on uh, yes, Dale Earnhardt. No doubt about that. Meanwhile, back in fourth and fifth, a good, pretty good battle here between Jeff Bonine and Mark Martin. And Mark Martin's another one of those guys, and Jeff also, that have been right up there all day long. Yeah, yeah. Mark Martin at the beginning of the race was, the, what, second fastest car here at the beginning of the race. And through the middle, we just didn't hear a lot about him. But uh, right now, there he is, racing for fourth. And Larry Pearson is into the pits with a problem on that car as a great deal of steam and smoke is rising from underneath of it. Yeah, the last time he went around the front straightaway, he had pulled to the inside of the track, and it sounded like he was running on about six cylinders. So Larry Pearson, one of the contenders this year for Rookie of the Year honors on the NASCAR Western Cup circuit. And here's Mark Martin about to make a move on Jeff Bodine. Indeed he does. Mark Martin goes to the inside. They cross the stripe, and Martin has the position. Well, of course, as I have said many times during this telecast, Stephen, we are doing 20 of the 29 Winston Cup races this year, and I got a feel, guys, that sometime during the season, possibly on one of our races, Mark Martin is going to become a Winston Cup winner. Now look at this, a battle for second. Here comes Alan Kowicki alongside of, and in fact, pulling ahead of Dale Earnhardt. We have a new second place guy. That's Alan Kowicki in car number seven, who's second, and he's got his sights set on the leader, Rusty Wallace. Man, I'm glad I took my heart to advice because I didn't think it'd be that easy getting around Dale Earnhardt. Well, I, I agree with you, Benny. I didn't think he could pass him that easy either, but he just went up there and motored right around him. Of course, he's got Rusty Wallace to contend with now, and uh, can he make it that easy to pass on him? How'd you like to be the baloney in that sandwich between Rusty Wallace and Dale Earnhardt? Man, it's, oh, looky here. Look yeah, Wallace goes very high. May have 
lost the lead right here. Kowicki is able to keep his car low on the racetrack as Wallace went high. And of course, that gave him the chance to get a fender up there, but he wisely backs off going into turn three. They're coming up on Ernie Irvin car number two, but now Allen decides to stick it under there. He's got the acceleration as he come off the turn. He's got him, I believe. I believe he does. Yes. Well, they were close going across the stripe, but I think oh, Allen oh, oh, no. I don't know. Well, Rusty now gets the momentum on coming off a two. That works very well for him. But coming off a four, Allen has the advantage. So he goes into three now, side by side, side, dead heat going into that turn. Watch him accelerate off the four, though. I think Allen is going to get him here. Oh, they split the difference. We got a problem right in front of the leaders. That's Dave Maynard the third spinning. And, well, Kowicki definitely won the race to the caution flag, that's for sure. Yep, but wow. now. Another you know, close call. Car a while to come on, so they're all going to come in the pits and get new tires. Oh, man. Another close call for Rusty, the third this afternoon, that something happened right in front of him. This time it was Dave Major the third, losing it in turn number four. I don't think he hit anything, did he? No, anyway, so he, he drove away. I don't yeah. think he hit anything. He was fortunate that the leaders didn't hit him, though, because yeah. they were trying to pass each other just as he spun. Well, I'll tell you, that took some co concentration as the leaders come down pit road. No surprise. Let's go to Jackaroo. Alan Kowicki is making his presence known first on pit row because he's the farthest back. He locks the tires up. The crew goes to work as Rusty Wallace, Jeff Bodine, the rest of them go in. You can see Wallace's crew going to work there. As Kowicki on the top of the screen taking the right side tires and Wallace on the bottom of your screen making the exchange as well. Now, the Kowicki crew goes to work on the left side tires. So it'll be four sets. Left side's going up for Rusty Wallace is away as well. And Wallace is away first. But Kowicki having a little bit of problem with the left rear, but he spins the tire as he goes away as Dale Earnhardt gets away as well. Well, Kowicki didn't have nearly the pit stop that Rusty Wallace did. No, he, he didn't. Uh, Rusty beat Earnhardt out that time. That's uh, They've been very close all afternoon on their pit stop, but Earnhardt has, uh, has beaten uh, Rusty several times. This time he didn't. So we're under another caution period here at Rockingham, and we're going to take another break and resume our live coverage in just a moment of the Good Wrench 500. Stay with us. One laps to go in the Good Wrench 500, and boy, I'm telling you, we are set for a shootout as the signal is being given for one more lap to go. We we're going to try to get some conversation in with Kowicki and Rusty, but we don't do that when the uh, drivers have to concentrate on going back to racing. Let's go down to Jerry Punch and Barry Dodson. Barry, these cautions are coming at opportune time for you. Just before the caution came out, your driver skittered up in turn two. What was the problem? I think we needed it, Jerry. We ran awful hard on the restart trying to gain some ground and maybe use the tires up a little bit. I tell you, Alan's been tough all day. You can't discount him and uh, got a iron head. I would say we needed the caution. Well, fresh rubber may be trouble because Rusty Wallace is on fresh tires. And Rusty will have the lead when we go back to racing here in about a quarter of a lap. That's Earnhardt there in second, car three, and then Kowicki in seven, and Bodine in five. That's the way they came out of the pits, and that's the way they'll resume. And so far, Rusty has shown very good strength when he has new tires on. We mentioned that a moment ago. Let's see if it still works this time as the green unfurls. Slow restart as the field comes down off the corner number four. Now they begin to accelerate. The green flag comes out. Here we go once again. about ready to go back to green after the spin down in turn one that involved Richard Petty. And here's the race out of the pits. You can see the black car of Earnhardt pulling out, Rusty Wallace on the outside in the white looking car. They touch as they come out and Wallace gets back to that line first. <laughs> A little friendly nudge there. Here's the top 10 quickly before we go back to green. It's Wallace, Earnhardt, Kowicki, Bodine and Martin. Second five, Allison, Marlin, Jim Sauter, Lake Speed, and Greg Sachs. And we've got six more laps to go. Here comes the green flag. This is going to decide the winner of the Goodrich 500. Rusty with a good jump on the start. Well, that's hard to believe that he got a five or six final jump with just five or six laps to go. Yeah, he really took off. Five and a half laps to go. Down the back stretch they come. There's Kowicki in number seven and Jeff Bodine in number five. They're battling for that third spot. 
Here comes Rusty off of corner number four with Earnhardt following. Then comes Kowicki, Bodine, and Mark Martin. Who's going to be leading the Rusty Cup if the race is to finish? Earnhardt? Dale Earnhardt should be the leader because Darrell Waltrip and Kenny Schrader uh, were tied for the lead coming into this race, and both of them had troubles. Incidentally, Ken Schrader was involved in that situation with Richard Petty. A lot of damage done to his car. Well, the Hendrick car is very impressive at Daytona. However, only Jeff Bodine now uh, is uh, looking good here in the late stages of the Goodwrench race as uh, Darrell Waltrip had his problems earlier, and uh, Kenny Schrader has not been real competitive all afternoon. Oh, that Pontiac arrest of Wallace is just I would think Alan Kowicki is probably second in the Winston Cup standings right now. No, I'm told that Jeff Bodine would be second if he would have finished as they are right now. Jeff, of course, finishing in the top five at Daytona, finishing fourth in the Daytona 500, so he's... Uh, Looks like headed for a top five finish here, running in fourth place right now. There's the interval between first and second as now Alan Kowicki begins to close in once again on Dale Earnhardt. We'll have the white flag displayed next time around, and Rusty Wallace has the race in hand, it appears. He's in turn number three now, headed toward the white flag from Harold Kinder in the indication of one more lap to go. Rusty Wallace sat on the pole for this race with a record-breaking speed. Here's the white flag. We got one more lap to go, and look at the battle for second spot. It is Dale Earnhardt on the inside in the black number three, and Alan Kowicki on the high side in the multicolored number seven. Here they come off of the second corner. The battle for second place rages on. Earnhardt is trying desperately to hold off Alan Kowicki. Points very valuable here. Kowicki, however, moves to the inside in turn number four. Here comes Rusty Wallace. He wins the Goodrich 500. And second place goes to Alan Kowicki by a bumper. And a close race also for fourth place, but Jeff Bodine just barely edged out Mark Martin. What a race for second. I tell you what. Alan Kowicki was impressive today. I still got <laughs> John Dodson tell he's number one. Jimmy Maycar is giving us uh, a view of reactions from many of the Kodiak people down there in the pit area. They're all very happy as their driver, Rusty Wallace, has survived a very grueling 500 miles here at North Carolina Motor Speedway. And for Rusty Wallace, it is victory number 11 in Winston Cup competition. His last win, of course, was at the final race of the year last year in Atlanta when he won the race but lost the Winston Championship to Bill Elliott. The top 10 finishers here this afternoon in the Goodwrench 500 at Rockingham. Alan Kowicki second, Dale Earnhardt third, then Jeff Bodine and Mark Martin finishing six through 10. Allison and Marlon Sauter, Speed and Sacks. We'll be right back. A very happy Rusty Wallace has pulled into victory lane and now gets the helmet off, and we go down for our winner's circle interview, which is being brought to you by America's best-selling replacement battery, the Sears Die Hard, Jack Aroot. Well, Whitney Houston's hit song is One Moment in Time, Be the Best That You Can Be. And today, Whitney and Rusty Wallace, boy, you both were the best that you could be, buddy. Well, thanks a lot, Jackie. Man, I tell you, the crew did everything, because those two final two pit stops, that was the key. And I told them, I said, come on, man, pull through for me. And they did. They had some killer stops. And Dale was dogging me pretty hard. And uh, I knew it. Uh, when that caution flag came out with 10 to go, I went, oh, man, it's going to be a shootout. Hey, listen, in addition to this, you've won $15,000 plus from Unical 76 Challenge. You're the first guy ever to do that in history. That's got to make you feel good, too. Well, I feel real good about leading the halfway point for the 10000 and getting the Unical's 15000 and we really raped up on them today. And I'd just like to say uh, I'd like to thank Kodiak, Mobile One, AC Spark Plugs, and all our sponsors that made this possible because without them, it wouldn't be uh, right. And I wish Raymond Beadle and Billy Miller and all those guys were here with us to share this. My wife, Patty, and son, Greg, and all of them. But... Uh, because I tell you, when you get down like we did at Daytona, this feels good to come back. Well, he's back, like he said at the top of the show, Bob. I'm 
Our congratulations to Rusty Wallace, who is back in Winston Cup competition. Coming up in just a moment, the IMSA Miami Grand Prix from Miami, Florida. And, of course, a whole lot of basketball action coming up the next couple of weeks here on ESPN. Tonight, East Tennessee and Marshall, and then Louisiana Tech and New Orleans at 9.30. Our thanks to Banquet and Ford Haviland for their sponsorship of our in-car cameras. My thanks to Ned Jarrett, Benny Parsons, Jack Aroot, and Cherry Punch for their work here today. We'll see you a little bit later in Darlington for now. This is Bob Jenkins. So long, everyone.